Hi, my name is Arpit Shah and I'll be narrating this video for you. First, you'll have to visit mapmyops.com. The landing page contains all my previously published work, which you can scroll down and access. My work can be categorized into four types. Mapping and GIS, which is core mapping, operations and supply chain, remote sensing and consulting applications. Clicking on a link will only isolate those articles which fall under that category. The topic for today is value stream mapping. But before that, I'll just let you know that there are two pages on the website. The about the firm page contains all the videos which I have published within the articles. So if you just want to see some visual content, then you can scroll it on this page. Whichever video you like, you can click on it and it can play within the website or you can click on the YouTube button and redirect to our YouTube channel. This is the about us section and this is the various fields in which mapping can be applied and GIS research uh, work published by others. Let's click on the value stream mapping article where I will take you through a detailed walkthrough. The name of the article is Value Stream Mapping for Lean Manufacturing Operations. This is quite a comprehensive article, a 70 minute read and as I scroll down you can see that there is a lot of graphic as well as text content for you to refer. But not to worry, there is also a section hyperlink table of contents which acts as a guide. You can see the layout of the article as well as whichever topic interests you in particular, you can click on it and go to that particular section within the article as well. To begin with the introduction, because value stream mapping is a tool which is used to incorporate lean manufacturing, I begin by defining lean first, which is the focus on continuous improvement and to eliminate waste and to get the right things to the right place at the right time in the right quantity. Subsequently, we break down value stream mapping into its components, which is value is what a customer is willing to pay for, whereas a value stream represents those material and information flows that are involved in getting a product family from its raw material state into finished goods in the customer's possession. Value stream mapping comes in two forms, the current state or the as is state of operations and the design of the future state, which is the to be state of operations. Moving on to the section hyperlink uh, table, uh, there is an introduction section which we are covering right now. Then there is a section on operations and supply chain fundamentals followed by value stream mapping symbology and a very detailed uh, elaboration of the Acme stamping company case which covers case background, drawing the current state, how to design a future state, interpreting the changes made, the guidelines and key questions to ask and so on and so forth. There are also detailed analogy based examples as well as concept notes which will enhance your understanding. Below the table of contents there is a short about us section where I have defined what the firm interlock mapping services does and you can click on any of the brochures to see what our offerings are as well. Moving on, let's address two important aspects which is what to apply value stream mapping to and where to apply value stream mapping to. I have used the example of Mepro, which is a manufacturer of confectionery to drive home the point. Value stream mapping has to be applied to a unique product family and its scope has to extend to the manufacturer's span of direct influence. Let's define a product family first. It is a group of products that pass through similar processing steps and over common equipment, particularly in the downstream processes. So I've used uh, a fictitious matrix of the products and processing steps at Mepro and you can click on any image to expand it and I've identified three unique product families at Mepro at its plant. How have I gone about doing it? As you can see that candies and chocolates have, are being processed by similar equipment and processes, particularly towards the end of the production sequence, which is why it is called downstream processes. And this is why it is a unique product family. Similarly, 
products 3 to 5 are have the same properties and it's a unique product family and product 6 is separate and it is a single product product family as well moving on we will define where to apply value stream mapping to i conclude that it has to be applied from the immediate supplier at one end to the immediate customer of the manufacturer at the other with the manufacturing operations in between of course this is because there need to be sufficient scope to implement operational changes now i've uh, elaborated it using examples that for example if uh, mapro wants to uh, change the quality terms of its supply it can do so but it can't influence the farmers to basically change the quality of the sugar cane which is why the scope of value stream mapping should extend to the supplier itself you can read it in detail in the article the next section deals with certain operations and supply chain topics which you should be familiar with which will enhance your understanding of value stream mapping beginning first with production configuration or basically the manufacturing strategy of a company now the various production configurations can be seen in this matrix from make to forecast at one end of the spectrum and the x axis to engineering to order now what do these configurations mean let's understand by focusing on make to forecast mapro the confectionery manufacturer practices this particular manufacturing strategy or a production configuration that is what is its definition it means that a manufacturer mass produces the products preempting customer requirements as it cannot wait for the orders to arrive and then begin manufacturing due to the unfavorable impact it has on the customer's lead time preferences because the customer is not willing to wait for a long duration such a manufacturer basically makes everything in advance and pushes it towards the customer in contrast fenesta practices make to order fenesta is a windows manufacturer of india why does it practice make to order because it can wait till the order is confirmed from the customer before manufacturing it windows so you can see it lies on the other end of the spectrum which is in which manufacturing design and purchase of raw material it does in advance but from fabrication to distribution of its windows it basically happens after the order is confirmed from the customer because lean uh, entails ma making at the lowest cost and you know incorporating more pull in the value stream generally value stream initiatives are taken when a manufacturer wants to go from the left side of the spectrum which is more push based towards the right side of the spectrum which is more pull based so he wants to incorporate more pull generally benefits from value stream mapping now i've given a couple of examples where uh, manufacturers have you know transitioned from one configuration to the other broad idea is that a manufacturer should know what each production configuration benefits are so as to maximize the next important topic is the seven wastes these are the wastes which lean manufacturer should strive to eliminate from the value stream to achieve peak levels of productivity waste is a concept which you will hear numerous times across this article so it is important to understand it very clearly this graphic will aid you in that it contains the names of the waste from transportation inventory to defects essentially it means excess transport build up of inventory excess motion and so on and so forth below the names lies the definition so transport is unnecessary movement of parts or material uh, over processing is non value added man or machine processing and so on and towards the bottom lies the various reasons which causes that particular type of waste so you can read this particular graphic in detail when you read the article now over production is considered as the deadliest waste because it spurs the other forms of waste so if you over produce there is an excess build up of inventory you have to transport in excess the manpower has to move a lot and the possibilities of defects also increases so which is why over production is something alongside inventory which you will hear multiple times during this article lastly you must get familiar with the all important topic of bullwhip effect which negatively impacts supply chain but once you understand the principles behind it you will also be able to relate it in a manufacturing context where value stream mapping tool has to be applied what have essentially happens is small fluctuations in end customer demand triggers bigger fluctuation in the ordering behavior upstream in the distribution network and which ultimately results in a vicious cycle of underproduction or overproduction at the manufacturer's end so 
to elaborate on this effect i have crafted very diligently a case using fictitious demand data of mepro syrups and i have taken multiple practical considerations into you know uh, i have addressed it in this particular demonstration and perhaps you may want to either pause the video and read the case in detail or you may circle back to the article itself whenever you are having leisure time and if you are interested to know more but essentially i will summarize it for you there are three supply chain nodes in the supply chain network of the mepro syrups the retailer wholesaler and the manufacturer that is mepro itself the retailer sells mepro syrup bottles to the end customers from his retail shop the wholesaler supplies mepro syrups but not in a bottle form but in a case form which is a higher denomination where one case is equals to 20 bottles so he supplies bottles in a case form to the retailer every week so the retailer receives demand from the end customer every day the wholesaler receives demand from the retailer every week the manufacturer upstream supplies to the wholesaler in crates where one crate is equals to 10 cases and he supplies the material the syrup bottles in every month to the wholesaler right so there are several practical aspects at play here the retailer in the first uh, on the section to the left the demand information for syrup bottles has been depicted as you can see it is not consistent while the average is 30 bottles the demand every day from every working day of monday to friday varies so based on the historical demand of 30 bottles it basically places an order for the next week of averaging 40 bottles per day so he has over ordered over here by 10 bottles per day assuming that the demand from the customers his customers next week remains the same as the previous week right the wholesaler also based on the average demand of 40 bottles per day which it receives from five retailer it serves it has placed an order of 48 bottles per day on an average from the manufacturer and the manufacturer doesn't have to order to anybody it's the manufacturer that is so he basically produces at a rate of 60 bottles per on an average per day per retailer that is so what does this tell you it tells you that there is an amplification in the mismatch the error the average customer demand was 30 bottles per day but then the mismatch between the demand and the ordering increases upstream now 60 and 30 just seems double to you but then once you multiply it you know across the number of retailers the number of wholesalers it translates into a very very big amount that is exactly it is over producing at a rate of 750 bottles per day than the actual syrup consumption right so uh, and this cycle of over production or over ordering at this particular point in time if everything else remains constant will reverse in the next cycle where there will be massive under ordering and under production so this begs the question why did the retailer over order in the first place couldn't it have just placed an order of 30 bottles per day based on its average historical demand now it can very well can but it didn't and there are several natural you know agreeable reasonable reasons why it did so for example because the demand was volatile in the previous week it had a maximum demand of 60 bottles the retailer felt that you know it should over order because it would not want to drive a customer away because the bottle is not available at the store so which is why to avoid the possibility of a stock out it did over ordering it could have also have over ordered because the minimum order quantity from a wholesaler would have been 10 cases but because you know uh, the demand was not 10 cases it was less than that but because the minimum order size is 10 cases it had to order that thirdly the retailer may also have ordered over ordered because there may have been supplier you know supply incentives if you order this much quantity then you get extra incentives and to be able to elig be eligible it thought why not you know keep extra stock but then get a bigger incentive or fourthly it can also be because you know transportation takes time so if there is any transportation delay there would again be a risk that you know the stocks would not last the entire week which is why the retailer may have over ordered and there could be other reasons as well but broadly speaking because of 
policy changes because of the you know denomination of sale because of you know willingness to not bear extra risk uh, of you know turning the customer away the over ordering happened in the first case right so what could have prevented this bullwhip effect bullwhip effect would have been prevented if you know the wholesaler would have known what is the end customer data in the first place which is point of sale data and likewise the manufacturer would have benefited had it known that the customer is ordering at an average of 30 bottles per day so th there are other ways to negate bullwhip effect but point of sale data and ready visibility of it is very important in curtailing the effect of bullwhip the bullwhip itself is a demonstration of a whip which you know has a small tip but then the volatility in terms of its movement upstream in the whip also increases so it, that that is why this concept is known as the bull whip effect now that you are aware of the fundamentals we can move to core value stream mapping and every map is built using certain format certain objects so the symbology of value stream mapping has been captured in this graphic so these are the list of commonly used value stream mapping icons and it has been categorized under four categories process material flows information flows and general and under each category there are five icons or a group of icons also each icon has a name and a short description so as a prerequisite uh, you can basically refer to what each of these icons mean and it will enhance your understanding when we jump into actual value stream mapping in the subsequent section so these icons have been obtained from microsoft visio and the editable icons file also has been uh, prepared and attached for your reference you can click on the link and click on the download button so that you can access this particular file now what does an editable icon file mean it means that if let's say you want to modify the icon in some way by editing the text uh, in in it by editing its shape slightly it mostly will be possible for you to do so all you have to do is download the excel file and then double click on the icon which you want to edit and make that necessary edit so at the end of this particular article if you feel like you want to craft a value stream mapping uh, you know map for yourself you can use this icon file and i hope it could be of good use to you the value stream mapping case involving acme stamping company forms the crux of this article i have elaborated it in as much detail as i possibly could have this is because it is a very profound case study one that enables a reader to have an excellent foundation of the value stream mapping tool and how it can be used to incorporate lean into manufacturing operations to give you a case background acme stamping company manufactures automotive components and it wants to map a particular product family that of stamped steel bracket sub assembly in short we'll call it brackets throughout the duration of this video as well as in the article this product family comprises of two products a bracket for a left hand drive vehicle and a bracket for a right hand drive vehicle respectively this bracket is basically installed underneath the instrument panel of a vehicle now both these products in the family are just sold to one customer a vehicle manufacturer called state there are two distinct aspects involving value stream mapping the first one is to draw the as is state of operations also known as the current state value stream map and the second being drawing the future state design of the operations which basically corrects on the you know shortcomings of the current state as well as blends it with management's vision the customer's changing preferences technological evolution and other factors so drawing the current state map you can assume that it is a relatively straightforward activity but then again it if you are new to value stream mapping this is the best way to begin your journey so if you were to draw a value stream map of the current state you first begin by mapping the customer facing processes first and then going backward or technically upstream in the manufacturing sequence and end up at the supplier facing process the rationale behind doing so is that uh, you are basically trying to align your company's manufacturing operations is material and information flows with the rate at which the customer is demanding the product so if you begin with the customer facing process first then you straight away get to know whether how the current state is basically 
responding to the customer's state of uh, you can say demand so this is the way to go about doing it so in acme's case let's assume that you have initially taken a you know quick tour of the plant to understand the manufacturing processes and how they are sequenced together for this particular product family thereafter you can begin your audit uh, for the stamped bracket or the brackets for product family you basically have the last process which is the most downstream process which is closest to the customer is the shipping department so you land there first and then obtain information regarding the customer so for example at the shipping department you figure that okay there is just one customer for the brackets product family state stream and you proceed to draw a customer box on the value stream map subsequently you add a data box underneath the customer box where you put in the key metrics regarding the customer you figure that state steel demands 18400 brackets per month two thirds of which are for the left hand drive version and the remaining are for the right hand drive version it does not order in individual bracket denominations it orders in trays and each tray a returnable tray that is contains 20 finished brackets uh, of either lh or a rh variant so this tray is the pack size which the customer basically buys your products in and this denomination is useful when you are planning to basically make certain revisions in the future state design so keep this in mind you also obtain the information that state steel uh, operates its plant in two production shifts and that it demands one shipment of brackets on a daily basis from acme to its plant the shipping department itself has a staging area basically a staging area is not to be confused with a warehouse which is uh, you can say a longer term storage uh, location this is a temporary storage location where once the finished brackets are released from production they are basically uh, you know temporarily stored over here and various you know processes can be done over here such as inspection auditing sorting and uh, documentation and so on before it is uh, assigned for given a go ahead for dispatch that is so yes after completing uh, the customer facing information after plotting it on the map you basically move further upstream which is going to the manufacturing operations of acme for this particular product family now you get to know that there are five discrete manufacturing processes for the brackets product family it begins with stamping and then goes into there are two welding operations and there are two assembly operations so these are five discrete manufacturing processes that you have identified during your audit now what does discrete mean discrete means that within the process the material flows uninterruptedly or you can say without a pause or without any inventory stagnating in between so it lies in a state of continually being processed within a product family now if you were to think about it this is an ideal state you would like to be in right so which is why you basically try to uh, club if there are two separate operations which you know flow uninterruptedly you don't necessarily depict it as two different you know manufacturing processes with two different process boxes you basically merge them together into a single operation a single process box that is so your objective is to find discrete manufacturing processes and by extending the same definition you can understand that between one discrete process and another an inventory is not basically being processed it either is stagnating or is let's say tra- being transported or so on so uh, fundamentally the value stream map is a high level depiction of the material and information flows so if a process is in an ideal state then you don't necessarily need to basically uh, allocate separate area on the map you have to basically safeguard the precious real estate also if you can notice that there are straight arrows between all the uh, manufacturing processes so now what do you figure out because and why did you do these straight arrows with triangles in between so it signals the arrows itself signals that the manufacturing processes currently are opting for a push based flow using a production schedule so a production schedule is basically assigned to it by a centralized uh, you can say 
department which uh, gives them the let's say a daily target in acme's case it's a weekly target but it can even be a daily target so in acme's case we'll get to it during the information section uh, these five processes basically uh, do not you know are not interlinked with each other they do not basically see what each other is consuming and then begin their production instead whatever target they are being given by the production control team they basically produce to it which is why uh, it is called a production uh, you can say schedule uh, daily production schedule so uh, and the triangle what does this mean the triangle essentially means that what is the uh, inventory that is stagnating between two discrete processes which you have identified during your audit now it can so very well be that during the audit there is a higher quantity of inventory which is stagnating so you are you will be better served if you just verify whether what you have observed is the norm or is there much variability and then you can identify what is the average you know inventory that is stagnating over there so uh, for example between stamping and spot welding your observation was that 4600 left hand drive and 2400 right hand drive brackets were stagnating so likewise you basically plot all the uh, flows uh, and as well as the stagnation and underneath the five uh, distinct process boxes there is also a data box and i'll explain to you in due course and beneath the data box is a timeline section which depicts production lead time so we will get to that aspect also an important aspect that i must lay stress on is that the stripe arrow while it does signal that the processes are producing in a push based flow uh, to a given production schedule it also signals that they are producing in large batches or in batch production mode it is quite natural uh, if you were to be given a large target let's say produce 10000 units of a and 20000 units of b in a week then your automatic reaction would be okay let me complete my target as quickly as possible so that i can get free so which what what you will do is you basically continuously produce a and produce it in large batches that is and you know then you basically perform a changeover and set up the equipment to produce another uh, you can say product variant of the product family so producing in batches is uh, something which lean manufacturing absolutely despises so just to let you know in advance so this is what is being signaled by the stripe arrow as well now moving on to the you know data boxes which and what do they depict so the cycle time is the rate at which a manufacturing process releases a single unit of output for example a cycle time of 1 second in stamping indicates that one stamp bracket is churned out as output every second from this process obviously when the stamping press is operational that is uh, change over time is the time it takes for the operator to set up into producing another variant of the product family in acme's case from switching over from producing lh to rh bracket or vice versa it also besides the equipment time that goes into you know setup uh, it also includes time that may be spent in terms of you know getting the material availability resource readiness and so on uptime is significant uh, signifies a on demand availability of the equipment that is the you can say a process reliability that is and 85% uptime in stamping indicates that the stamping press equipment was inoperable for 15% of the available working time historically so this is a signal of 15% downtime and 85% uptime is equal to 15% downtime that is uh, this particular data point is typically documented by the operator or can be pulled from the equipment log it is not something to be measured based on you know your uh, anecdotal evidence so this has to be you know quite a systematic figure which you will not be able to use your, your observation uh, during the audit to come arrive at the epe signifies every part every or uh, called a production batch size so what does this mean it indicates the time a process continues to make a particular variant in the product family before performing a changeover to manufacturing another variant so in epe of 2 weeks in stamping indicates the stamping press produces stamped lh brackets for 2 weeks before changing over to producing rh brackets for the subsequent 2 weeks production shift is very simple to comprehend it's the number of man days a plant is operational in a single work day the bracket product family is manufactured at acme in two production shifts in a day where one shift is equal to 8 hours or one man day that is. so there are two man days in a day the time available is the available working time per production shift 
it is captured in seconds so as to avoid any confusion that may arise from depicting this metric in a higher uh, form in a decimal based form that is so a lunch break of 20 minutes per shift is there so this is not a productive time so it ca can be deducted from the shift duration of 8 hours per production shift uh, to arrive at the 27600 seconds of time available uh, besides these six metrics which are you know uh, captured the key operational information at Acme's manufacturing operations for the bracket product family. You can also include additional metrics such as scrap rate which is the rate at which defective products end up being generated by the process or the rework rate which is the time spent by it on correcting the defects. So such additional metrics can be included but it was not felt necessary in Acme's uh, case. Now at the bottom of every map lies a timeline sequence. So this timeline basically depicts the production lead time information. So production lead time is the time a uh, particular uh, inventory spends in the value stream. So the elevated portion of the timeline indicates out of process you can say production lead time. So uh, this is not uh, the, while the depressed portion is within the process uh, you can say a production lead time. So the out of process production lead time can be you know the time spent in stagnation as is prevalent in Acme's case or it can also be related to you know time spent in transportation or any other activity besides being processed whereas the production lead time within the uh, process is uh, signals you know in a way the cycle time so in Acme's case it has assumed that both are equal the production lead time within a uh, process as well as the cycle time this is natural right because if these processes are discrete manufacturing processes where the material inventory that is does not pause it processes you know uninterruptedly then naturally the production lead time would be the equivalent to the cycle time so this may not always be the case because sometimes discrete processes may have some you know tiny amounts of uh, inventory which is ends up stagnating within and it can still be depicted in a discrete process perhaps, but then that's being too technical so in this particular acme example you can assume that both of them are equal the production lead time so what straight away you can see is that on the right hand side there is a production uh, lead time total now the total is 23.6 days so 23.6 days production lead time is the total of all the elevated and the uh, depressed uh, portion of the timeline section so it is the total time a single you can say uh, bracket spends in the value stream or you can say from its input to the output as a finished bracket how much time it takes basically is 23.6 days and processing time is the time which is spent in while being processed the production lead time that is so it is totally 188 seconds so straight away you can you know observe that the processing time is such a short duration for acme's case for this product family whereas the total time uh, which a bracket takes is very long so this straight away should you know uh, raise your uh, antennas that something is not right right so so this is the uh, portion uh, of the timeline section now that you have completed the manufacturing operations section you can jump to the uh, section involving the supplier side uh, uh, material flow so you came to know during the audit that there is a single vendor of steel coils michigan steel company which supplies uh, the steel coil as per the orders which the production control gives it to it on two days a week so twice a week it supplies the uh, shipments of steel coil to the stamping process which you know uh, receives the inbound shipments of raw material so this uh, you know kind of closes the loop the customer facing processes the, uh, the the manufacturing operations and the supplier facing flows so this closes the material flow loop in acme's current state so thereafter you are basically left with the information flow so uh, how do you basically uh, you know what do these uh, uh, say, uh, lines uh, represent so you can see that there are two formats of lines the straight lines and the wiggly lines so straight line is using traditional you know methods of communication like you know manual communication or written communication oral communication and so on whereas the wiggly line depicts a electronic uh, method of communication now i have already told you that uh, the manufacturing processes receives a weekly schedule on the basis of which it receive you know does the manufacturing it receives a production target on a weekly basis uh, you know it is perhaps sent using a you know internal circular uh, and which is why it is depicted in a straight line form and you can also see that the production control which is the centralized you know production uh, uh, department you can call it 
uh, it basically receives uh, information from State Steel, which is the customer, and it also transmits information to Michigan Steel Company, which is its vendor. So, what information does it receive from State Steel? It receives 90, 60, and 30 day forecasts. So, essentially, the amount of brackets State Steel will produce, uh, which it estimates it will produce over the next 30 days, over the next 60 days, and over the 90, next 90 days is being signaled over here. Besides that, State Steel also gives the production control at Acme a daily order. This is the actual purchase order of how many brackets it you know wants uh, Acme to supply to it. So this is it receives a daily production order. So this uh, completes the loop between the it, of the information between Acme and the customer. Between Acme and the supplier, a similar loop is there, but this time Acme submits a six weekly forecast. So every one and a half what whatever number of steel coil it estimates it will require over the next one and a half months it basically transmits to it on a uh, what you call electronic basis also it gives a weekly you can say purchase order it places a purchase order on michigan steel company to supply the steel coil which it supplies you know twice a week and completes the purchase order that is so this basically completes the entire uh, production uh, you can say, information flow loop so now that we have you know completed all the loops of material flows and information flows we can basically uh, see the uh, en uh, entire you can say value stream map current state value stream map of acme stamping company uh, my suggestion to you is you can basically download this particular uh, map because uh, when you read the article that is because you can easily refer to it whenever you you know uh, read something and which you want to basically tally it with the map and the same is applicable for the future state value stream map as well. I must add that this daily ship schedule is what production control issues to the shipping departments. So while it issues a weekly production schedule to the manufacturing processes, it issues a daily skip schedule and that is understandable because it has to transport the brackets on a daily basis to state steel assembly. So this is just the instructions how much quantity the shipping department should transport to state steel the customer. Also, this MRP stands for Material Requirements Planning. It is basically a software which production control uses to determine how much to produce, when to produce and so on and so forth. So this is what MRP stands for. Also there is one correction to be made. I think I made a, I, I said that this, these are the 90, 60, 30 day forecasts that State Steel Assembly estimates to produce. So it's not estimates to produce, it is how much it estimates to procure from ACME. Moving on, we will go to the future state design of a value stream. This is nothing but the revised material and information flows that will facilitate lean manufacturing. And the objective of lean manufacturing is to basically make the product with the shortest production lead time. Uh, in Acme's case, this would be the shortest amount of time that a bracket should spend across the manufacturing operations of the highest quality at the lowest cost and with the most dependable delivery. So these, this is the overarching theme of Lean and uh, this is what ACME will strive to do through its future state design of the value stream. So let me reveal the uh, design right at the outset. So what does this map represent? Now without going into the interpretation aspect of it, let me just state the facts. So if you can see this is a belt plus assembly process and you can tally it with the current state map. This process does not exist in the current state. So this is a new continuous flow process and we'll get uh, to know more about it later. There are three supermarket pull systems that shall be deployed, which will regulate the flow of steel coils, stamped brackets and finished brackets respectively. There are four Kaizen bursts that have been planned, one for the stamping process and three for the uh, well plus assembly process. And now both the inbound and outbound shipping will be done on a daily basis. In terms of these were the material flows and in terms of the information flows, production control will release production instructions, not a production schedule with a pitch of 20 minutes to the weld plus assembly process. State Street, the customer will continue to share three forecasts with Acme, the total quantity of brackets it will procure over the next three months, two months and the, over the next month respectively. Acme will also continue to share one forecast with the supplier, 
the total quantity of steel coil it will procure over the it estimates it will procure over the next six weeks. State Street will also continue to share its actual purchase order for the finished brackets with Acme on a daily basis while Acme will now issue its purchase order for the steel coils with Michigan Steel on a daily basis as well. And in terms of the operations timeline, Acme as you can see will now target to restrict the production lead time total to 5 days and the total processing time to 169 seconds. So this is the overall factual information that is depicted over here. So what changes do you see and you know can you think why these changes have been made. So the next portion of the video will focus on that. So the questions that we seek to answer are what prompted ACME to revise its material and information flows in this particular manner. What was the methodology used to identify, you know, waste uh, uh, and non-value added stuff in the current state and introduce countermeasures in the future state design? And, you know, how does ACME stand to benefit by adopting lean manufacturing? You've already known that, uh, you know, they uh, reduce their total production lead time. In the future state, it is mentioned that it has been reduced. Uh, so, so how, how does it, uh, ACME benefit? And, you know, is just the time reduction the only benefit or is there something else? So, we'll hone in on addressing these questions. Now, what we are trying to do next what i'll try to explain is that while i can give you a you know a technical explanation of you know the lean concepts terminologies and uh, you can basically will be able to relate to it but then i feel that it is not the right way to make a connection between value stream mapping and lean manufacturing and to many and including me when i first was exposed to value stream mapping it much of it went above me. So I think, you know, uh, I've, I've crafted three, you know, uh, um, you can say analogies, which will basically, uh, hopefully, uh, make it all the more easy for you to understand what is being done in this future state design and how basically it will improve the operations uh, of the, uh, you know, manufacturing which ACME does for the brackets family. So the three uh, analogies are the bottleneck analogy, the uh, ODI chase analogy and the library card system analogy. So, so I hope, you know, you, you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoyed uh, drafting this particular thing. So, what is the bottleneck analogy? So, I won't uh, go into the details, but the overarching theme is if you see a normal bottle, the neck of the bottle is a very, you know, a utility, right? Because it allows the drinker to drink or pour from it at a convenient pace. So, but then you also know that bottleneck as a term is also a negative toned term as in it's not used positively. So, why does this bottleneck, uh, you know, is used negatively? I mean, it should be a positive thing, right? So, so essentially, I mean, I mean, I know you will understand what a bottleneck is, but then uh, to, you know, really spell out what the negatively themed bottleneck, as in without a space, B-O-T-T-L-E-N-E-C-K, what does it stand for and why does it stand for? So, if you can, you know, assume that, you know, you are in a very thirsty state and you want to drink from the bottle and you're not drinking from a normal bottle, but you're now drinking from a... Uh, you can say a differently shaped bottle, an oddly shaped bottle where the neck is not at the end, but it's right at the middle. And, uh, you know, you are basically assume that you can put your purse, your lips over the end of this bottle and drink from it. So when you begin drinking and you're very, very thirsty, the liquid shall flow from this end of the bottle and flow into your mouth. Uh, but then and you will be, you know, satisfied because it's been pouring into your mouth at a convenient pace and you can adjust the pace as well. But when the beverage flows from the left section of the bottle, you will basically feel a big sense of dissatisfaction because it will be pouring out at a lower pace. So if you can, you know, uh, make that connection that if you are a customer and let's say the bottle is equivalent to the manufacturing operations, then if any manufacturing process throttles the rate of product creation below the customer's pace of consumption, then that process becomes a bottleneck. So this is when the highly utility bottleneck becomes the uh, uh, negatively prone bottleneck. So you have to basically manufacture at the rate at which the customer is buying the product or wanting to buy that product, right? So, 
what if you may ask if the customer is satisfied with the flow rate despite it being throttled by this particular bottleneck i mean i'm fine with the slower pace okay you may feel that it is a good thing right and the customer is satisfied but then you may be guilty of committing a major major sin which is that of overproduction because if your lowest uh, you know the uh, manufacturing process which is manufacturing at the least uh, you know rate of production is producing at a rate which is satisfactory to the customer then it uh, also kind of indicates that the other manufacturing processes may be guilty of uh, producing at a faster pace because this is the slowest paced process so the other uh, processes may be guilty of producing at a f the there's a high chance that they are producing at a larger pace or maybe they may have adjusted their pace and made it similar to the bottleneck but there is also a high probability that they are producing at a faster pace so while the end product may be released at a slower pace but then in the upstream manufacturing processes it may be produced at a faster pace so you know overproduction is just not restricted to the uh, overproduction of finished goods it can be overproduction of the work in progress inventory also so and you know via the bullwhip effect and the seven wastes which i had indicated to you earlier that excess you know overproduction is something it's the deadliest waste of all and it spurs all kind of waste creation such as excess inventory excess transportation excess de defects and so on so this is something uh, you know if even if your bottleneck is you know uh, producing at a rate which is equivalent to customer you should not be you know satisfied you should check whether you are actually overproducing and if so you must take corrective action so this comes you know you uh, continuously heard inventory 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 during the videos so what does you know what kind of inventory is there so the inventory can be of three types the raw material inventory which is you know the core materials from which the uh, you know uh, the finished product is built then there is a work in process inventory which is basically semi finished uh, goods uh, which flows through the manufacturing process and then there is the finished goods so what is inventory it is representative of the capital time and resources spent on aspects such as raw material processing operators sorting auditing transportation material handling storage and financing so you see inventory is not just a good lying there in the value stream it is representative of all the you know time cost resources that you have spent on doing a whole lot of activities and you know all these costing you will not realize until you basically make a finished product firstly and that finished product is sold to the customer and the money comes from the customer to your pocket so until this loop is completed your money or working capital is blocked in the inventory which is why you know i think that after overproduction excess of inventory is uh, you can say a demon in the value stream so you have to have to basically control excess inventory and which is why you will see much of what lean manufacturing does in this particular case is to basically tackle inventory uh, stagnation in a better way either to completely eliminate it or trying to basically regulate its uh, you know stagnation so this is it and uh, yes so you know besides the real cost time and resources there is also the opportunity cost you, you can you know the time you basically or the cost you basically spend on inventory maybe you could have diverted it to some other product family or you know invested just in a fixed deposit in a bank and you would have get gotten you know or invested it elsewhere and you could have gotten better return so just not the actual cost but the opportunity costs also matter and so you'll have to basically control how inventory is basically done and over here what i like is you know uh, the emphasis in accounting as such is to basically trying to reduce the direct cost by you know producing to scale but then what this kind of you know uh, you know lean kind of indicates that that may not be at, and you know it is certain it's that it is not the right way to go because you know you may try to lower the direct cost but then all your cost in terms of you know inventory you are not basically taking into consideration so you'll have to be very very mindful and not just go in a spate of reducing direct cost without taking into consideration all these kind of costs that accumulate by you know inventory and other forms of waste so if you see acme's current state you'll see that considerable inventory is stagnating before each and every process so while the cost of inventory is not mentioned it is depicted in the production lead time terms and you can see that in terms of lead time it is so high compared to the processing time so uh, this is what the bottleneck analogy is subsequently 
I would like to go and explain a few more important lean objectives through the library card system analogy. So this is again something which has fascinated me as in, you know, you libraries, uh, you know, you must have visited library during your school days and you must have seen how, you know, the book is issued to you, how you borrow it, you know, how you return it, what are the documentation involved. And, you know, it, it's just, it's it's a seamless process. It's a, you know, standard process. And you may not have, you know, paid much attention to, you know, what is the beauty of this particular process. So, so I thought, you know, this particular analogy will drive home, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, important aspects that uh, Lean does. So, if you see that, you know, in this uh, depiction, these are the, and, you know, maybe it will refresh your memories and you'll have beautiful memories of visiting a library. But then what happens over here, if you see that, you know, there are uh, a book card holder, a books card, the due date sheet, borrower's book issue card and borrower's ticket. So, using these five components, I've crafted a storyline that, you know, okay, in your, you know, I, I wouldn't repeat it, but uh, just to give you an overarching theme that, if you, and you can read it in the article itself, that, you know, the, this particular system of using these documents to issue a book to you is known as the New York system of discharging. So, this is the official name and you can read more about it, you know, by researching yourself. But then you basically obtain the book from your, the shelf and submit it with the ticket to the librarian. And, you know, the librarian is located near to the library's entrance or just before the bookshelf section. And then he extracts the book card from the holder, makes an entry into it, inserts it with the ticket in the pocket and files it for record keeping. Also, librarian will stamp the book's return date on the due date sheet and, you know, books fly leave and subsequently hand the book to the borrower. So, the borrower will also make a data entry about the book's name and its due date in his own issue, book issue card and the librarian, you know, will sign it as an acknowledgement. And, and when you return the book, you basically, you know, uh, acknowledge the, uh, the librarian acknowledges the receipt of the book and he strikes off the, you know, entry which he had made. So, right. So, this is a simple way in which, you know, uh, the entire transaction loop of you borrowing a book and, you know, returning it from a library is completed. So, what is the beauty about it? You know, one is that it is an elaborate system of recording a transaction. So, nothing, you know, happens, you know, verbally. There is everything is happening through a particular, you can say, device, a signaling device. So, one which, you know, and the beauty is that anytime a librarian wants to know how many books have been, you know, uh, borrowed from the library, he doesn't have to do a physical audit, right? He can basically just see this documentation and immediately get to know that, okay, these many books are not currently with us and these many books are naturally with us and you know his position in the library which is nearer to the shelf or right at the entrance also uh, kind of you know acts as a security check right it, it it gives a reminder to the you know visitor that you please return the book or you know make an entry into the book and you know if any you know somebody is you know uh, you know missed uh, he's borrowed a book and he's forgotten to you know uh, get it validated he can still you know warn them that you know you please uh, come over here and get this entire process done so so this is the second aspect the third is you know the borrower also just like the librarian can understand what has happened how many books are there the borrower if let's say you have bor borrowed multiple books because you have the entry in the card you don't need to basically search your home or search your bag how many books you have borrowed and when is its return date so it, it basically documents it properly so how does this basically entire library thing tally with lean manufacturing you may wonder so compared to a traditional push based value stream a lean pull-based value stream features extensive communication exchange between the manufacturing processes. This is because in a traditional value stream, what happens is the manufacturing processes are issued large production targets, which are known as production schedules by a centralized production team. So what they do is they produce to that target in batch production mode, i.e. in large quantities at a time. So the need to exchange information between the manufacturing processes among each other is fairly limited. Compare that to a lean value stream where the processes are interlinked with each other and where a producer process needs to monitor how much the consumer process is consuming and produce according to it in a timely fashion and in an error-free fashion in small quantities that is. This is where traditional communication methods would fall short because they are not timely, they are not reliable and you basically want the operators to focus on producing effectively, which is their main job, rather than communicate effectively. Hence, the smart signaling mechanisms is the need for it is felt. This is where 
you must draw the connection between the library card analogy which uses several components such as cards and holders to ensure that the transaction loop between the librarian and the borrower is basically systematic. Similarly, in a lean a shop floor, a manufacturing shop floor that has incorporated lean, there needs to be systematic exchange of information between the various manufacturing processes. Also, just as in the librarian's case, who does not need to basically conduct frequent physical audits to see how many books are there in the library. Similarly, you do not want time to be spent or you're rather wasted in doing audits. You want the exchange of information to be so reliable that you do not have to do frequent physical audits. Thirdly, the there is a system of information exchange using signaling devices known as Kanban cards, which are frequently utilized in a lean value stream. These Kanban cards have similar properties to what the library card uh, components have. So this will be explained to you in much, you will realize the you know, connection between the two in much more detail in the subsequent section. Also, one can draw a linkage between where the librarian is seated in the library and how it serves as a vantage point to track borrower behavior and how it ensures overall operational efficiency to the presence and location of supermarkets in a lean value stream. So the concept of supermarkets will be explained to you subsequently, but know that how the librarian's position influences operational efficiency. In a similar way, the supermarket's location influences operational efficiency in a lean value stream. Moving on to the last and the most comprehensive analogy, the one day international cricket chase analogy. Now I've used a example of a popular sport in my home country and I hope you are familiar with this sport because several interesting concepts that are applicable to lean manufacturing can be understood in a such a uh, easy manner by using this particular analogy. So what to set the context first. In the match summary scorecard you can see that England the team batting first had scored 302 runs in their quota of 50 overs, which is how a one-day international format of cricket match is structured. And Australia breached the score with two balls to spare, thereby winning the match. Now, the parallel to lean value stream and future state design does not occur after the end of the match. Rather, I would like to transport to you at the halfway stage, where Australia now has to come out to bat to chase this target of 302 runs at nearly a run a ball because 50 overs is equivalent to 300 balls and in those 300 balls they have to score nearly 300 runs. So this is a fairly large target and which would require Australia to continuously be abreast with the asking rate throughout the duration of the match. This is because if they score at a lesser pace, then the target will soon be out of reach and they will lose the match. And if they were to score at an aggressive pace, they would run the risk of losing wickets, which again would imperil the chase. So to translate this in a lean manufacturing context, if you consider England as being representative of the customer, the target it has set as being representative of demand, and Australia to be the manufacturer, the first learning to be drawn is that it is important that the manufacturer produces enough to meet the customer demand. And to borrow from the previous bottleneck analogy, the manufacturer should also produce at a same or similar rate at which the customer is demanding the product. This is because overproduction is the deadliest of all the seven wastes and Lean recommends manufacturers to pay close attention to batch production inclinations across processes because that is often a major driver of this malaise. Secondly, would it be wise for the Australian coach to issue a scoring schedule and lay down his expectations in its entirety to all the Australian cricketers at the outset as in when the chase begins? such as instructions such as player 1, I expect you to score 50 runs, player 2, I expect you to score 70 runs and so on. No, it wouldn't be prudent to do that. Rather, the Australian batsmen themselves will be better placed if they 
adapt their scoring strategy to the prevailing match situation when they step out to bat instead of scoring as per a predetermined schedule issued by the coach. The learning in terms of lean manufacturing to be drawn here is that lean recommends that rather than a centralized production control department which is representative of the coach in cricket, rather than the department issuing individual you know, M MRP based production schedules to multiple manufacturing processes, it should only issue the production target to preferably just one manufacturing process. And that is typically to the one that is situated closest to the customer, which means the most downstream process in the value stream and translating into a cricket context, the cricketers who go out on the field to open the chase. So the other cricketers or the other manufacturing processes upstream to this process should be linked via pull so that their pace of production becomes tethered to and regulated by the pacemaker's rate of production. So the pacemaker is basically the one process whom production control issues the production targets to in a lean manufacturing context. The reason behind doing so is by issuing large target, the process operators are incentivized to produce the desired output in a siloed individualistic manner and in large batches, which induces the generation of waste. And we've highlighted our overproduction, but then you also know that it also induces all the other forms of waste, such as overprocessing defects and so on. Moreover, instead of a push based flow, such as batch manufacturing, a pull-based flow, which lean, which lean manufacturing endorses, also instills flexibility in production and is better equipped to handle demand volatility, which is quite prevalent in the modern day. Thirdly, to outline the learning from what I would like to emphasize at the outset, production control must not issue the production target to the pacemaker process all at once. Instead, it should release it in small and practical quantities and at consistent time intervals. To cite an example, the pacemaker process who receives the instructions from production control must not receive a large production target or the entire production target from production control, such as make 7500 units of product A and 2000 units of product B by the end of the week. Rather, what Lean emphasizes is smaller production targets are should be released throughout the workday at consistent intervals such as make 50 units of product A now, make 55 units of product B now and so on. To translate this logic in cricketing terms, the Australian coach would be better off if he issues his run scoring expectations in small chunks at uniform intervals, let's say in five tranches. First, before the match begins to the opening batsman and subsequently at the end of every 10 overs to the Australian batsmen who are on the field at that point in time based on the prevailing match situation. The objective behind this lean recommendation is to persuade the process operators, just like the cricketers, to remain switched on and be mindful of their rate of production and also to get them into a state of flow of achieving small targets with perfection rather than being swayed by large targets and attempting to chase it down in a haphazard manner. This technique of miniaturizing the production target and issuing it at consistent intervals is known as production volume leveling. And the exact production increment issued to the pacemaker is known as the pitch. And this term is also prevalent in cricket, so you don't confuse the pitch in lean manufacturing with the pitch in cricket. So the pitch is usually equal to or a fraction of or a multiple of the tucked time into the customer's pack size or minimum order quantity or average order size. So there are two components. One is the tucked time and the other one is either of pack size or order quantity of a minimum nature or the order size. So what is tucked? So Takt is basically uh, the time in which a process should manufacture one unit of output in order to fulfill the customer demand completely from the available working time at the plant. 
So what does that essentially mean? It essentially means uh, devotion to the customer objective in a very miniaturized form. So in what time should I produce just one unit of output? So the reason why we scale up this particular output is because we want to give the production increments which is of a practical nature. You wouldn't ask uh, the processes to make one product at a time. So you need to scale it up. And to scale it up, you need to have certain up practical benchmark so the benchmark could be either the pack size which is the uh, you know the size in which the customer places his, his order let's say he wouldn't place an order for five candies he may place an order for five pouches so that that would become the uh, pack size uh, minimum order quantity is what you know the minimum order size basically and the average order size is the av average order size across customers so you need to have a practical benchmark to scale this particular uh, Tuck time to and which would translate as the pitch increment. So in a in a cricketing context, the Australian coach will not should not rather issue a scoring instruction such as score 20 runs every 19.5 balls. As while 20 runs is a small target, but this is clearly impossible to execute because the number of balls is 19.5. It is not an integer and, you know, you cannot keep a tab on a non-integer uh, in a cricketing, you know, uh, parlance. So even a feasible instruction such as, let's say, score 50 runs in every 49 balls, this is feasible, like it's doable. But then it is not a practical instruction because uh, it, it translates to a decimal form in, in the denomination that cricketers are more comfortable with, which is overs. So 49 balls is 8.1 overs. And to give an instruction that you do something in 8.1 overs is not as practical as, let's say, saying uh, score 50 runs in 8 overs, which is much more practical. So the pitch needs to be practical. The reason why I'm emphasizing on this topic so much is because this, in a way, is the crux of lean manufacturing, the production leveling. So uh, if you relate to cricket and its uh, uh, parlance very well, then, you know, you will be able to understand the main central component of lean manufacturing as well. So what leveling of production volume actually does, it helps create a tucked image for the pacemaker process. So the takt image is basically the process operator will have a sense of duty towards the end customer and he will know that you know the reason why he is being issued small quantities and uh, small uh, small quantities at regular intervals is because he is his rate of production is being aligned with the customer's rate of consumption so rather than issuing a large target and you know he producing individually siloed manner batch production and re resulting waste this is a much much more better way to do that and in a pull based value stream the having a strong takt image basically reverberates across the value stream as, as in upstream so the pacemaker is the downstream process but because if you uh, if you recall bullwhip effect which we discussed earlier in this video uh, the, the emphasis on amplification upstream of the demand data also happens occurs here so if there is a strong takt image at the pacemaker process it would also translate to a strong takt image upstream in the manufacturing stream and if it is a weak or a faint takt image then the result would be similar and amplified upstream as well Right. So, uh, in terms of going to the next uh, learning and the last learning, I must say, uh, between ODI cricket and lean manufacturing, that is, is that there is a handy tradition in one day cricket in particular of rotating the strike. So, what does this mean? Uh, it means that when um, two batsmen at the crease frequently interchange strike to face the bowler. This is known as rotating the strike and many of you may be familiar with this. So two benefits of rotating the strike in a cricket uh, chase in particular is, you know, it unsettles the bowler's rhythm. So the batsman is able to receive easy scoring opportunities as well as because uh, the bowler is, his rhythm is not that great. The probability of him bowling a good ball and the probability of losing a wicket also reduces. Secondly, it also allows the partnership between the two batsmen to flourish because the on-strike batsman can take a breather and renew his focus while his partner can come on to the strike and, you know, score some runs from himself. So, in the context of lean manufacturing, the learning which I would like to emphasize is to switch 
frequently between manufacturing a particular variant of a product family to another one rather than continuously producing one variant for a long time even if the production instructions are miniaturized and released in short intervals so let's say if you are being uh, given issued uh, instruction of producing 20 units of a and repeatedly while it's a pitch it is being issued at pitch increment it's a small quantity practical instruction and so on but then you wouldn't want to do that at least there is a good enough rationale that lean suggests why you shouldn't do that and which is covered in the concept note later as well rather than that you basically switch on from let's say you produce 20 units of a then you move on to producing 20 units of b 25 units of c and so on so so the idea is to break down the ma manufacturing of the product variants in much more evenly so so th this concept is known as leveling the production mix and there are several benefits to be derived by pursuing this strategy firstly it allows the production to become flexible as it reduces the need for keeping large quantities of working inventory for all the variants in the value stream because there will be production of all the variants so all the processes will have much more you can say quicker or steadier stream of uh, inputs of the all the product uh, variants at, a, at at its workstation secondly it also reduces the scope of operator idle time or overtime or product defects as the operators without uh, mix leveling would resort to batch production and you know it induces these uh, uh, you can say negative traits also uh, it reduces the this pursuing this strategy reduces the total production lead time as all the product variants would be manufactured much more frequently and besides mixed leveling also entails minimizing the change over time so that the switching between manufacturing one variant to another which involves you know equipment setup time resource readiness and so on that basically does not become a constraint or a hindrance so once you reduce the change over time it is akin to basically uh, you producing the same product itself with uh, you know no breaks in between so collectively the concept of uh, leveling the production volume and production mix so these both strategies are not to be applied in isolation they have to be applied concurrently so the mix leveling and volume leveling is known together as load leveling and or haijunka which is a japanese term uh, and this is of a particular importance in lean manufacturing so the overall objective of uh, pursuing load leveling or haijunka is to convert uneven customer demand into predictable production flow with this three analogies the learnings which you have derived can be summarized under lean guidelines or key questions to ask which you can see in this particular visual so there are seven guidelines for future state design first is you have to produce to your tap time second is you have to develop a continuous flow wherever possible in case continuous flow is not possible then one can use supermarket pull system besides other strategies to regulate the flow of inventory fourth is to send the schedule or you can say the production instructions to only one process so that it becomes the pacemaker of the pull based value stream fifth is you have to distribute the production of different products evenly over a period of time as in frequent changeovers which is leveling the production mix sixth is you have to create an initial pull by releasing and withdrawing small and consistent increments of work now this particular aspect was not covered in any of the analogies but we have a dedicated concept note for it later on in the article and finally we have to develop the ability to make every part every day or epe of one day this is a minimum target that a lean value stream should aspire to achieve and if it were to achieve it it should reduce it even further to every production shift making every part every production shift or even in smaller denominations until it reaches every part every pitch so pitch as you know is a function of tap time into customer pack size so if you manufacture to pitch that means you are changing over very very frequently so that you have a very very great sense of 
production flexibility, which allows you several benefits in a volatile demand environment. Now, these guidelines have been translated into key questions which you can ask while designing a future state design. The, what you see on the right hand side of the screen, you can pause the video or you can refer back, circle back to the article later, but it is one and the same. It is just basically elaborating the guidelines in a question format. With these guidelines serving as our framework, we are now ready to unpack and interpret ACME's future state design in a step by step manner. So first, I have pasted both the current and future state value stream maps one below the other once again in the article so that you can refer it or even better download it so that it can serve as a reference point when it comes to enhancing your understanding during the course of this article. The first thing which we will try to observe is has how has ACME spotted its bottleneck in the value stream. In order to identify the presence of bottleneck processes in the value stream, we'll first have to determine tap time, which is the rate at which ACME has to produce finished brackets in order to meet state streets demand out of its available work time. The monthly demand for state street production control anticipates that it will remain as it is in the current state, that is 18,400 finished brackets. Given that there are 20 work days in a month and two production shifts in a day, this translates to a demand rate per production shift being 460 packets. Further, we can drill down to 27,600 seconds of available working time per shift after deducting 20 minutes of lunch break from the 8 hour duration of a production shift. So, tuck time, which is available working time in a production shift, divided by customer demand per production shift, translates to 60 seconds. So, it can be interpreted as when ACME's plant is operational for the brackets product family. ACME would need to manufacture one finished bracket every minute in order to fulfill State Street's monthly demand of 18,400 units. Now we can plot the cycle time of all the five manufacturing processes as you can see in this graph. In the chart, you can see that assembly one is the only process which is cycling at a slower pace than the tact of 60 seconds. As a result, it becomes the bottleneck process in the value stream. Through this step, we know two aspects. One, in our future state design, we will have to reduce the cycle time of this bottleneck process by at least two seconds in order to produce finished brackets at a rate that state street is demanding, which is 60 seconds per bracket. And secondly, while the process is upstream to assembly 1, that is both the spot welding processes and the stamping processes, while they remain unaffected by the bottleneck as such, they may be guilty of overproduction as their cycle times are much quicker than that. If so, we will have to regulate it as well. That being said, the actual first step of designing a future state begins after this step, which is to identify where, if at all any, to implement continuous flow in a value stream. What is continuous flow? For technical topics such as these, I have included concept notes in this section that would aid your understanding. So let's begin. Do recall that while preparing ACME's current state map, I had indicated to you that we should include separate process boxes for manufacturing processes that are discrete, i.e. where material flows uninterruptedly within it. So, I would like to imagine, I would like for you to imagine a hypothetical scenario where instead of assembly one process in the current state map of ACME, we have a process known as drilling, coating and inspection. The metrics for this reimagined process as captured in the data box remains the same as assembly one. The only exception being that instead of one operator which was present for assembly one, now there are one operator for each of the three processes. And because it is 
clubbed under a single process box. This translates to the total number of operators being 3 operators. Why have we merged all these 3 operations into a single joint process? This is because these operations are interlinked with what is known as a continuous flow, where the output of drilling is instantly transferred as an input for coating, which begins processing it immediately. And similarly, the output of coating is instantly transferred as an input for inspection, which begins processing it immediately as well. Therefore, there is zero inventory stagnating between these three operations. Hence, continuous flow is also known as one piece flow as either a unit of inventory or a batch of inventory is processed as well as transferred one at a time. Evidently, for continuous flow to work in its pure form, all the linked processes need to operate at a similar pace, that is, have a similar cycle times. This is because if there is a mismatch in cycle times, then there inevitably will be inventory that would stagnate. Now, continuous flow can be slightly less pure as well, wherein, let's say, tiny amounts of inventory may, may stagnate and you have the freedom to still consider it as a continuous flow. Continuous flow ceases to exist once the inventory is not being processed, i.e. it could stagnate or could be transported or could be stored. In ACME's current state map, after this reimagined process, drilling, coating and inspection, comes assembly number 2 process and you can observe that there is inventory stagnating in between. Hence, after inspection, the continuous flow breaks. With this concept in mind, let's begin to identify which manufacturing processes in ACME's current state map could potentially qualify for continuous flow integration. The sequence of selecting processes in the value stream that could be linked in a continuous flow begins with the closest customer facing manufacturing process first and going upstream from there, that is from right to left in a value stream map. The rationale remains the same as was applicable in the drawing of the current state map if you recollect. You are basically trying to align production with the customer and hence it is important that you begin from the customer facing process first. Nonetheless, you may wonder why this emphasis on the word manufacturing. This is because any manufacturer's most downstream process where material flows occurs is the shipping or the outbound transportation process. And linking it in a continuous flow would imply that inventory would not stagnate between production and shipping. That is, the very moment a finished product is manufactured by production, it is loaded onto a dispatch vehicle. Naturally, this does not occur in reality as the finished goods are typically put away in a warehouse or have to be staged before being shipped. And staging, as I had indicated to you earlier, is a temporary storage area where the material is not being, in lean terms, being processed. It is basically halting over there so that it can be accumulated, sorted, audited, inspected and so on until a go-ahead for dispatch is given. Thus, stagnation of inventory between production and eventual shipping is inevitable and thus, by definition, a continuous flow cannot be implemented here. Now, this does not mean that we cannot do anything to regulate the quantity and duration of stagnant inventory here. As you can see in ACME's current state map, there is also a significant inventory stagnating between production and shipping and we will have to try to regulate it, but we will deal with it in a later section. Nonetheless, now let's move on to ACME's last manufacturing process that is assembly number 2. Linking it in a continuous flow implies that inventory can be made to flow uninterruptedly between assembly 1 and assembly number 2 process. Is linking these two processes in a continuous flow possible? Why not? There is nothing to indicate that having a common workstation for assembly 1 and assembly 2 processes is not viable. Yes, their individual cycle times are slightly far apart. However, because assembly 1 has a slower cycle time than assembly 2, works to ACME's advantage if it decides to set up a continuous flow workstation here. 
as inventory wouldn't accumulate as it would have if it was the other way around. Moreover, there is considerable value that can be released by eliminating the excess inventory stagnating at this juncture in the ACME's current state map, which is 1200 left hand and 640 right hand brackets. So, if inventory stagnation is the benchmark in which we are going to identify, then there is ample amount of excess inventory between all the manufacturing processes. For example, between spot well 2 and assembly 1, spot well 2 and spot well 1 and so on. So then, can ACME deploy continuous flow between all the manufacturing processes? Well, there is no stopping them to doing so. But unfortunately, it must leave out one process. If you were to see how the stamping processes icon has been designed in the current state map, you will see that it is slightly different than the other manufacturing processes. This is just to highlight that this particular process that is not a dedicated process, i.e. it does not serve the brackets product family alone. The high capacity stamping press also serves other product families at Acme. Hence, implementing continuous flow over here is tricky because if Acme were to decide to do so, then the constraint would be stamping presses high cycle time for the brackets product family. It basically churns out one stamped bracket every second compared to the subsequent downstream process which is spot weld one which churns out output at a rate of one processed output every 39 seconds. And if you were to even consider the desired time in which this process should churn out output, which is equal to tact of 60 seconds, then you can see that ACME would have to slow down this process considerably in order to make it compatible with continuous flow. Hence, it is prudent that you leave this process house because if you were to slow it down, then that would mean that this particular high capacity equipment would not be able to serve other pro pro product families from its available working time and ACME would have to purchase new equipment to uh, serve the other product families, which is not an ideal scenario. Barring this particular process, all the other processes are compatible with continuous flow. This does not mean that there is no scope for process improvement. Lean manufacturing prefers processes that are linked by continuous flow as it implies that their production lead time would be the lowest possible. Now, while this is the obvious advantage, there are certain aspects that one needs to be mindful of while thinking whether to link a particular process with continuous flow. Basically, all the processes need to synchronize perfectly within a continuous flow workstation. This would necessitate that each of their cycle times are similar, if not equal. This would necessitate that each of their process reliability is similar, if not maximum. And this would necessitate that their cycle time are aligned with the tuck requirement. Now, what does this mean in ACME's case? If you were to see the reliability of spot well number 2, you can see that it has a 20% downtime. This is not the case for the other three processes shortlisted for continuous flow, who operate with maximum uptime. Therefore, there is a scope to improve this particular aspect and ACME should only consider installing a continuous flow workstation if it were to manage to improve this. Secondly, we have already identified the bottleneck process, which is assembly number one. This is the only process which is basically cycling slower than the tuck requirement. So we would also need to slow it down by two seconds for this continuous flow workstation to be working effectively. Now, despite saying all of this, you should be assured that linking these processes in a continuous flow is an attractive option to pursue if feasible. This is because this would eliminate 6.5 days worth of production lead time due to inventory stagnation that occurs between these processes currently. All of this idle time is a waste as significant capital and resources is blocked on stagnant inventory as explained earlier. In the future state map, this process box for this continuous flow workstation can be labeled as weld plus assembly, essentially implying that both the welding and both the assembly operations are being performed in this workstation. And by virtue of it being the most downstream, discrete manufacturing process in the value stream, it would also become ACME's pacemaker process 
the one process which receives miniaturized production targets from production control and whose own rate of production would determine the rate of production for the processes located upstream which would be connected by pool in a lean manufacturing value stream. We can now proceed to the next section which deals in seeing whether the next best alternatives to continuous flow are viable to be deployed at those locations where continuous flow was not being able to be applied in ACME's future state value stream design. Now as you are aware the entire concept of continuous flow hinges on the elimination of stagnant inventory. But then there are also certain instances where stagnating inventory would be beneficial for the value stream. For example, stagnant inventory can act as a safeguard against demand volatility, supply volatility, transportation delays and equipment downtime. So in situations where the management anticipates these problems to surface, then having an uninterrupted continuous flow workstation may prove detrimental. Nonetheless, this does not mean that one should have excess of stagnant inventory. There has to be a limit to it or to put it in a better way, the excess inventory needs to be regulated nonetheless. Hence, we will explore two alternatives to continuous flow which are excellent to regulate inventory despite keeping a certain portion of stagnant inventory which can prove to be useful in adverse situations as I had highlighted previously. These two particular alternatives are called the supermarket pull system and the first in first out lane also known as FIFO lane flow strategy. Firstly, we will explore the concept note of the supermarket pull system. The supermarket pull system comprises of two components, the supermarkets and the Kanban. Let me explain supermarkets first, whose function is not too dissimilar from the way a traditional supermarket works, where a customer visits a supermarket to procure finished goods, while the staff replenishes the shelves at regular intervals so as to keep it full of stock. Similarly, in a lean manufacturing context, a supermarket is also a controlled inventory zone where a customer process shops for its inventory input as per its immediate requirements, while the producing process is asked to manufacture inventory output only when and only as much as is needed to replenish the inventory in the supermarket to its default range. Overall, this approach not only helps to regulate stagnating inventory, but it also ensures that the production of output is tethered to the consumption of input via pull-based flow. Now to understand the way Kanban system works, you may want to revisit the library card analogy because there is a lot of similarity between both these systems. The context over here is that regulating the material flows via a supermarket is not enough. One has to regulate information flows as well. This is because as you are already aware, in a future state value stream, there will be production volume and production mix leveling, which would necessi necessitate that all the processes collaborate between each other and exchange information regarding inventory consumption and production multiple times during a day. Therefore, if the information is conveyed using traditional mechanisms such as orally, telephonic or written communication, then this leaves scope for errors in transmission, delays in transmission and so on. Hence, the need for a smart signaling mechanism is felt. Figure number 34 depicts the various icons which form a part of the supermarket pool system. In particular to the Kanban system are the withdrawal Kanban card, production Kanban card, Kanban post and signal Kanban. You may want to pause the video to read the description which is adjacent to each of these icons. Nonetheless, I must make you aware that not all of these icons are used in every instance. Basically, their usage is need-based. To explain how a supermarket pull system works in a practical scenario, which is how a supermarket and a Kanban card system work together, I have used a demonstration of a chipset manufacturing setup. 
refer figure number 35 and understand the flow of operations that I am about to explain. Process B's operator extracts a tray which contains 20 chipsets from a stock bin near his workstation in order to process it. Once the tray is emptied, he keeps it aside. Process B's material handler spots this empty tray and pulls out its withdrawal Kanban card which is attached to it and proceeds to submit it to Process B's supplier which is Process A's supermarket which is nothing but a storefront containing Process A's chipset output. The receipt of a withdrawal Kanban card signals the supermarket that the customer process is demanding 20 chipsets and proceeds to give it to the material handler. Upon receipt of the new tray, material handler deposits it once again in process B's stock bin, thereby replenishing it back to its original level. Now this is one chain of flow. The other chain of flow happens at the supermarket who upon receiving the withdrawal Kanban from process B's material handler proceeds to print a new production Kanban card and hands it over to Process A's material handler who in turn submits it to Process A's operator who receives the signal which is essentially a production instruction that he has to initiate manufacturing 20 new chipsets. Once it is manufactured, the material handler will transfer it to process A's supermarket. Upon doing so, the inventory at the supermarket is also replenished by the same quantity of chipset that was withdrawn earlier by process B. Isn't this a methodical approach? Now this is a traditional depiction of a Kanban card system where one unit of production Kanban is equivalent to one unit of withdrawal Kanban. But this is not always the case. Imagine a scenario where process A's chipset manufacturing equipment has a processing capacity of 60 chipsets at a time. That is, while it can process a lesser quantity of chipsets, but it is not feasible to do so because it will incur the same cost, time and resources as it would for 60 chipsets. In a traditional Kanban system, if you were to just transfer a single production Kanban card, which is representative of uh, instruction to manufacture just 20 chipsets, this would be misrepresentative because you would like to utilize the processing capacity of the equipment to the fullest. Instead, a signal Kanban card is used. In fact, it's not a card, it is a metal triangle which is typically used as the signaling device. That metal triangle is dispatched to A's workstation and A is the producer process only when the supermarket inventory reduces by a minimum of 60 chipsets that is upon the receipt of three or more withdrawal Kanban cards where one withdrawal Kanban card as you are already aware is a depiction of one tray of 20 chipsets. So if you assume that A supermarket is designated to hold 10 trays of chipset as its working inventory, only when the number of trays reaches 7 will the signal Kanban be dispatched to process A, whose operator will thereby interpret receiving this signaling device as the instruction that please begin manufacturing a new set of 60 chipsets. The signal Kanban is therefore also known as batch Kanban because it is asking the producer process to produce it not as per a single denomination but as per a batch denomination which in this case is equal to three production Kanban cards. And this equivalence of one signal Kanban to three production Kanban cards has been predetermined and it can basically be equivalent to some other denomination also as basically is feasible in that particular context of application. 
from a value stream mapping perspective, the slanted arrow underneath process A in the figure will now read every 60 parts, whereas the production Kanban icon will be replaced by the signal Kanban's triangle icon. To explain to you what a Kanban post is, it has a function that is similar to the library books card holder in the library analogy. It is basically just a location where the withdrawal Kanban cards are accumulated before it is transferred. Lastly, the physical pull icon can also be used to depict material flow when the inventory is withdrawn from a supermarket on a manual basis. That is, when the movement occurs without the use of material handling equipment such as a forklift or a trolley. Overall, the supermarket pull system is an effective flow strategy. Its context of application is when the number of products in a product family is limited and when the inventory in a supermarket can be quickly replenished whenever it runs low. Now, why is this so? To explain this in a better way, let's explore another flow strategy which has a contrasting use case, which is the first in first out lane. In this pull strategy, it is typically used when the number of products in a product family is high. This is because keeping inventory of numerous variants in a supermarket format is not very practical because it's a controlled inventory zone in a manufacturing shop floor. FIFO lane is also preferred when the time it takes to replenish inventory is high. That is, the production lead time of the processes upstream is high. This is because the supermarket, even a traditional one for that matter, hinges on the fact that the material can be quickly replenished. When it can't be so, then you will need to find an alternate way because supermarket is not suitable in such instances. And FIFO lane is a suitable alternative. Also, the FIFO lane is considered effective when the inventory is of perishable nature or if it is very expensive or if it is infrequently used. As it is difficult to enforce, first in first out method of inventory transfer in a supermarket format. Now let me explain to you the workings of the FIFO lane flow strategy in much more detail using this demonstration. You can observe that process B lies on the ground floor whereas process A lies on the first floor directly overhead process B. Now process A is the manufacturing process for process B who is in effect the consumer process. Whenever the operator of process B needs material, it basically proceeds to extract it from the bottom of the tube. And whenever process A sees that the tube is emptied of a certain portion of inventory, it will only replenish as much inventory that is required to make the tube full again. Now what happens within the tube is that the order in which inventory was deposited into the tube is also the order in which inventory is extracted from the tube. Hence, inventory that entered the system, i.e. first in, is also the first to exit the system, i.e. first out. The tube in itself is a representation of lane, which is basically a inventory zone which transfers material from the manufacturing process to the consumer process. This FIFO lane flow strategy acts as a production regulator and is suitable in cases where supermarket system is not viable as both of them have contrasting use cases. Nonetheless, in a practical scenario, FIFO lane is not a gravity based approach as is depicted in this demonstration. It occupies a horizontal portion of the shop floor between two processes in a plant. But in effect, both the supermarket pull system and FIFO lane have the same end goal which is to induce a pull based production flow which regulates the stagnation of inventory. Now in Acme's context because the number of variants are few only two which is left hand drive and right hand drive brackets and because the production lead time is anticipated to be low in the future state because the actual processing time if you were to observe it is very very low 
Therefore, as brackets are neither expensive, neither perishable, nor infrequently consumed, and because of these characteristics, installing a supermarket pull system is a much more preferable option than to deploy a first-in, first-out layer. Now, if you see the value stream, we have already installed continuous flow operation at certain location. Therefore, we need to see whether installing a supermarket pull system is feasible at the remaining junctures in the value stream, precisely to regulate the flow of steel coil, which is the raw material, which accumulates before stamping. Secondly, to regulate the flow of stamped brackets, which accumulate between stamping and spot welding one process. And lastly, between assembly two and shipping process. As you will observe from ACME's current state, considerable inventory stagnates at each of these three junctures. Now, principally, installing a supermarket at all these three junctures is fairly straightforward because what a supermarket essentially does is it reduces the reliance on stagnant inventory because whatever is consumed from the supermarket is quickly replenished by the producing process. At least that is what the foundation of a supermarket is. So, Let's examine the first supermarket first, the raw material supermarket. There is five days worth of steel coils that stagnate, that has been observed to stagnate at this particular juncture and it makes utmost sense to regulate it. However, this particular juncture, the replenishment will be under the purview of an external stakeholder that is ACME's supplier of steel coils, Michigan Steel Company. Currently, it supplies consignments of steel coils twice a week, which essentially translates to a replenishment time of three to four days in the future state design. Now, this is not a good enough replenishment time. In an ideal scenario, ACME would prefer that the material gets replenished every production shift. So, whatever is consumed in a production shift gets replenished in the next production shift of the day. However, keeping practical considerations in mind, the very least that ACME can try to uh, extract from Michigan Steel is a daily consignment of steel coils at least. This would reduce the reliance on stagnant inventory to a fairly great extent. Whether to install the stamped bracket supermarket is again reliant on whether Michigan Steel basically supplies the steel coils because this will have a ripple effect downstream in the supply chain as well. And whether to install a finished goods supermarket once again is reliant on the delivery lead time of Michigan Steel. Nonetheless, there is an alternative option over here which ACME can away. Instead of relying on a finished goods supermarket, it can produce brackets directly to shipping, which essentially means that the weld plus assembly will receive production instructions and instead of transferring it to a supermarket, it basically transfers it directly straight to staging department which is located in shipping. So how has ACME assessed this opportunity? For the raw material supermarket, ACME believes that it can convince Michigan Steel to supply the steel coil consignments in a much quicker way than it does today. Precisely, it can convince it to supply steel coil consignment on a daily basis. This is because Michigan Steel has several regular customers in this region and were it to adopt a milk run based delivery mechanism, then it can supply smaller consignments to multiple customers during a day rather than issuing bulky consignments to fewer customers a day, which it does currently. So this milk run is traditionally borrowed from the name itself, which is how the milk is supplied to your door every day, where a milkman takes a delivery vehicle and transports milk cartons or you know milk pouches to each and every customer who falls on that route. So by doing so, Michigan Steel will also be benefited because it can offer greater customer service levels to the customers on that route. Moreover, its own production lead time remains unaffected. It can still produce the coils as it does currently. Only thing is it basically distributes it in a different way than it does today. Also, ACME has targeted that it will keep 1.5 days worth of coil inventory in this supermarket. Now, how has this 1.5 days figure been determined? 
you must understand this conceptually very clearly. One day of this 1.5 days is the proportion of working inventory and it is intrinsically linked to the replenishment time of the steel coils. What it means is because ACME will receive its steel coil every day, it has the flexibility to adjust its purchase orders on a daily basis as well depending on what it foresees as the demand of stamping process for steel coils on the next day. So essentially what it has to manage is only the duration between two successive consignments which is one day and in that one day it is basically keeping one full day worth of spare coil inventory which it, it can use to basically meet any cyclical changes in demand also known as working inventory. The remaining 0.5 days is basically a buffer inventory which is in this case to protect against any coil transportation delays that may occur from Michigan Steel's end. So, this is how the 1.5 days of supermarket inventory at this for this supermarket has been determined. I would also like to add that the working inventory stored in a supermarket format is not to be confused with safety stock. Safety stock is utilized in emergency situations only such as stockouts, demand surges or equipment breakdown and so on and so forth. Whereas working inventory or cycle inventory is basically meant to address small routine normal fluctuations in demand on a daily basis. For example, if you are aware that the monthly demand for your product is X units, then if there are minor deviations from to that on a daily basis, let's say on a daily basis while the average would be x by 30 but on some days it will be x by 30 plus a few units and on some days the actual demand will be x by 30 minus a few units. So that deviation from the mean is what the working inventory is meant to address and not the emergency situations. So what is the impact of having this supermarket? The stagnating inventory will reduce considerably precisely by 3.5 days or 70% because the new production lead time will be 1.5 days worth of supermarket inventory and the previous one was 5 days of oil inventory stagnation which therefore subtracting one from the other you get 3.5 days. Besides material flows ACME will also need to structure the information flows at the supermarket. As you are aware, a supermarket pull system comprises of two components, the supermarket as well as a reliable information signaling mechanism known as Kanban card. So, because there is an external stakeholder for the production Kanban card, the actual purchase order acts as the production Kanban card. So, a separate production Kanban card will not need to be printed. Also, the withdrawal Kanban card which is what stamping will basically accumulate throughout the day based on its consumption of steel coils will not be transferred to ACME's production control on an individual basis. Rather, a Kanban post will be installed where all the withdrawal Kanban cards that stamping process utilizes across both its production shifts will accumulate. One withdrawal Kanban card would be equivalent to the consumption of one steel coil. And at the end of the workday, production control will have the accumulated working uh, withdrawal Kanban cards collected from the Kanban post. Thereby, it will get to know the total quantity of steel coil that stamping has consumed during the day. And using its MRP software, it will proceed to estimate the requirement for the subsequent day as for, per the information that it receives from State Steel, the customer and it will place the daily purchase order with Michigan Steel, the supplier of steel coil, who will obviously replenish the super, supermarket inventory by roughly the same quantity that was withdrawn by stamping process on the previous day. Now coming to supermarket number two, this supermarket also known as stamped bracket supermarket lies in between stamping and the continuous flow weld plus assembly process. It will link stamping's production to well plus assembly's consumption in a pull flow. 
and there is no decision to be made over here as such because uh, Michigan Steel has is uh, you know will be convinced to supply the steel coils on a daily basis. So uh, having a supermarket over here doesn't have any constraints as such. So ACME has designated that just like the previous supermarket over here. 1.5 days worth of stamped brackets inventory will be kept, which is but a one day of working inventory that is 920 brackets plus 0.5 days of buffer inventory 460 brackets to safeguard against replenishment delays or production issues faced by stamping. So the benefit from installing this particular supermarket will be that 6.1 days or 80% of production lead time would be eliminated from this juncture which is but 7.6 days minus 1.5 days of supermarket inventory. 7.6 days is the current, uh, you can say, inventory stagnation that occurs at this juncture. And in terms of in information signaling, the withdrawal Kanban cards will be transferred on a default basis, that is individually from Well Plus Assembly to Stamp Bracket Supermarket. But in terms of denomination, one withdrawal card will represent an exhaustion of one bin of either left hand drive or right hand drive stamped brackets. Uh, for your visualization purpose, assume that a bin is a small plastic container that can hold 60, 60 stamped brackets. And you may wonder why use a small container and how has this 60 brackets a bin denomination been determined? So, Spot welders who form a part of the Well Plus assembly operation will benefit from having stamped brackets inventory in small containers within their workstation because continuous flow workstation is a compact space and to keep inventory in large quantities is not practical. Rather, keeping it in small quantities but with regular, you can say, supply is a much better alternative. Also, in a lean value stream, the focus post leveling the production volume and mix is to also reduce the change over time. So, spot welders have a change over time of 10 minutes, which they are spending currently between switching from one bracket variant to another. Now, it would need to reduce this change over time and instead of going outside the workstation to collect the uh, stamp brackets, it would benefit by having small containers of stamp brackets within its workstation so that the change over time can be reduced. And the reduction in change over time also implies a reduction in waste because if you recollect in motion was also one of the seven wastes in a lean value stream which was explained to you earlier. Now as for the bins 60 stamp brackets holding capacity. 60 units is basically one hour of processing time for weld plus assembly in the future state. Uh, assuming that because the time is 60 seconds, to make this process viable, the stamped brackets will basically need to be processed minimally one bracket a minute. So, assuming that this computation holds true, a 60, so basically the inventory is being kept in one hour, you can say, processing time chunks, which is both a miniature quantity as well as a practical quantity to represent one withdrawal Kanban card. Also, the 60 stamp bracket is a exact multiple of the state street, the end customer's pack size of one tray, which is 20 units. So, this is essentially three times the pack size. So, having a, you can say a synchronicity between pack size and the denomination of inventory transfer in a value stream is also a useful trait to keep because ultimately you are aligning your production to how the customer is placing his finished goods orders. Moving on, while the withdrawal Kanban cards will be transferred one at a time, the ACME has decided that equivalent production Kanban cards will not be issued by stamping supermarket to the stamping process one at a time. Rather, a signal Kanban, which I had explained to you earlier, is basically a form of a batch Kanban, will be issued to stamping instead. And the denomination of this batch Kanban is 
basically whenever the supermarket inventory is reduced by 5 left hand drive variant of bracket bins or 3 right hand drive variant of bracket bins. When stampings operator receives this signal Kanban, it basically serves as a production instruction to him to change over the stamping press and begin making a new batch of either 300 left hand stamp brackets or 160 right hand stamp brackets. So you may wonder why is there a difference in the denomination of this withdrawal and production instructions and didn't we just say that lean despises batch manufacturing then why is it wanting the stamping process to manufacture stamp brackets in batches. So to explain the rationale we know that state street which is the customers bracket demand per day is 920 finished brackets two thirds of which is of a left hand drive variant whereas the balance is of a right hand drive variant which is roughly one third. Notice from the current state map that the cycle time of stamping press is very low that is one second while its change over time in comparison is very high that is one hour. Now even if we were to imagine that we will reduce the change over time once we do load leveling which we plan to do subsequently still the proportion of the processing time to the change over time is very highly skewed towards the change over time. Hence, it does not make much sense to perform a production for a short duration and then perform a changeover for a longer duration and continue this cycle and loop for this stamping process which also as you are already aware is not a dedicated process to stamp uh, brackets alone. It serves other product families as well. Therefore, it is prudent to allow stamping to receive production instructions to produce in slightly larger batches than a miniaturized quantity which is applicable for all the other processes. Also, the overarching theme is to reduce the EPE which is every part every which essentially is that all the variants in a product family needs to be manufactured in a much shorter time in interval as in their distribution of production needs to be much more uh, you can say evenly spread and it, the production should be much more frequent that is. So currently the EPE for stamp brackets is two weeks as you can observe in ACME's uh, current state map. Now we have to basically reduce it by as much as possible by giving it an by giving a production instruction of 300 left hand drive brackets or 160 right hand drive brackets you are basically trying to manufacture the product variants every production shift because if you remember 920 brackets is the demand rate of state street per working day and because there are two production shifts this translates to a demand rate of 460 brackets per shift. Now because stamping is linked to well plus assembly and well plus assembly itself is linked to the end customer's demand rate, what is guaranteed is that stamping will receive a production instruction of 460 brackets, stamp brackets every production shift and by giving it a signal Kanban to produce either 300 RH or 160 LH, what is guaranteed is both the variants will be produced in a single production shift. Therefore, the EPE will reduce from once uh, for from two weeks to EPE of one production shift which is a 96 percent improvement. As for the final supermarket, we collect that ACME had a decision to make whether to install a finished bracket supermarket or whether to have well plus assembly produced directly to shipping. Now if it produces directly to shipping, then stagnation of inventory is completely eliminated because ACME will only be producing as per miniaturized production instruction. So there is no scope of inventory stagnation. Whereas a supermarket by itself is a uh, storehouse of stagnating inventory, although it is regulated. Now ACME has determined that having a supermarket is a better option. This is because it does not want to leave well plus assembly exposed to the fluctuations in demand that potentially State Street can impose on ACME. Now, if there is any demand volatility, 
then weld plus assembly needs to adjust its space accordingly. And you already know that weld plus assembly is a new manufacturing process so as to say and it will basically rely on basically four different kinds of processes working in close collaboration. So you would like to keep the production flow at this joint process as stable as possible and not expose it to the you can say the whims and fancies of the customer which is located just adjacent to it. Therefore, installing a finished goods supermarket even if it contributes to a little stagnant inventory will act as a buffer against any demand volatility. So, this is preferred in this case. Acme has decided that it will keep two days worth of inventory at this particular supermarket which is a 0.5 days increase than the previous supermarkets. The rationale being because this is a customer facing process, it wants to keep an additional buffer so as to basically address any demand volatility and able to fulfill state street demand on a regular basis without fail. This two days is broken into the component of 1.5 days of working cycle inventory that is 1380 finish brackets plus 0.5 days of buffer inventory to safeguard against replenishment delays and equipment issues faced by well press assembly. So essentially the increase of 0.5 days is purely in the working or cycle inventory that is. In terms of the overall benefit, the reduction of production lead time will be to an extent of 2.5 days. Uh, currently it is 4.5 days so because 2 days will of stagnant inventory will be there in the supermarket, uh, 2.5 days will stand to be eliminated which is 56% of production lead time stands to be eliminated. And in terms of information signaling, it is not very complicated at this particular supermarket. Both the withdrawal as well as the production Kanban cards will be issued and it will be issued as per default I, that is individually. Uh, the denomination of each card will be exactly the same as the pack size of the customer that is one tray or 20 finished brackets and therefore this would be a practical Kanban size too. Now that we have completed linking all the processes in the value stream with a particular flow strategy, be it continuous flow or the supermarket pull system, we can now proceed to do load leveling with paste withdrawal at the pacemaker process. The characteristics of this particular topic I had discussed during the ODI chase analogy, so you may want to recollect it right now. The idea is that all the processes in ACME's value stream are linked in a pull based flow. Now production instructions can be issued by production control to the most downstream manufacturing process which is the belt plus assembly continuous flow workstation. So what ha does ACME have to determine now? It has to identify the quantity and the distribution of production instructions at this particular case maker process and how it will be incorporated in the value stream to facilitate lean manufacturing. So we will proceed with the first topic which is the quantity and distribution of production instructions and for doing so ACME will deploy Hijunka or the load leveling technique. So there is a concept note for load leveling and followed by a concept note for paste withdrawal also. So for load leveling uh, you know that it comprises of two separate components one is the production volume leveling and the other one is production mix leveling. And leveling is also a synonym for the word balancing. We have already discussed that the, purposing, the purpose of leveling the production volume is to miniaturize the production instructions in order to create a predictable production flow. What extent should production control miniaturize the production instruction? We had also discussed this that it is usually a function of the tuck time and the pack size. Although you may also use the average customer demand or the minimum order quantity to scale up the tuck time based miniaturized uh, you know, uh, quantity. Also you must uh, be aware that the instructions are not conveyed orally or by traditional means. 
it will be conveyed by a, a sig via signaling mechanism known as kanban cards which we had already discussed in the previous section now if you see the chart the table in this particular figure number 44 this is a leveling of production volume explanation and demonstration at a macro level so if you see that the demand forecast is given on a weekly basis of a particular you know product and just in time production just in time production is based on what the immediate order confirmation arrives you basically produce to it so the just in time production is basically uh, mimicking the demand forecast assuming that you know the demand forecast is what the customer will actually order so in this way you can see that there is volatility one week the production team will produce 3200 units and the other week it will produce 4500 then back to 3700 and so on whereas if you do production leveling on a three weekly basis what we've essentially done is basically clubbed all the first three weeks is demand forecast together and basically uh, done a average or a mean of it which turns out to be 3800 units so what happens right now is for the first three weeks the production will receive a predictable flow which is a instruction to produce 3800 units therefore in similar way from week number 4 to 6 and 7 to 9 we've done production leveling so this basically stabilizes unpredictable demand to a predictable flow also if you see that the demand forecast is 3200 and what the production will produce in the first week is 3800 so it will have excess end of week inventory of 600 units in the second week because the demand will be 4500 units and because production will be producing 3800 units once again what happens is the excess 600 unit will uh, be utilized so 4400 units are there but the demand is 4500 so you you see there is a mismatch of minus 100 inventory over here so where how can we address this mismatch this is where the supermarket inventory which is a storehouse of you know the working inventory or the, what is called as the cycle inventory will be used so the, these are the you know routine ordinary fluctuations in the cycle inventory demands which basically you have a supermarket for and safety stock whereas is if there is an emergency uh, you know which arises in either from the demand end or from the supply end and you cater to since production volume leveling is done in anticipation of actual customer demand Uh, an aspect that you need to ensure is that the forecasts have to be reliable however if you are aware that there is there tends to be a high variance from actual demand with the forecasts then what you can do is you can keep an additional quantity of working inventory in the supermarket this is what acme exactly does in the finished packet supermarket because it is unsure of what the state steel customer how its demand pattern would be in the future state it has kept an additional 0.5 days of working inventory for the finished bracket supermarket only moving on uh, let's discuss the leveling of the production mix so by definition it is to it is done to ensure that the distribution of production of a product family is evenly spread over the available working time with minimal time spent on changeovers thereby allowing the manufacturer to produce flexibly and also be responsive to changing customer requirements now production volume leveling and production mix leveling are applied concurrently and while volume balancing is comparatively easier to comprehend you basically you know uh, average out the production target of in in a miniature from but mix balancing is slightly trickier to implement and may also appear counterintuitive to some so let me explain to you how both volume leveling and mix leveling is done using a demonstration imagine that there are three products in a product family a b and c the daily rate rate of demand is 200 units of a 400 b units of b and 800 units of c and the change over time which is the time it takes to set up the equipment and resources to manufacture another product variant is 30 minutes for all the products so if we do both production volume leveling and production mix leveling ie we do load leveling then the production instructions may flow in this particular order for example you produce you are given an instruction to produce 20 units of a then 
you are instructed to produce 40 units of beef which automatically necess- necessitates that you do a change over to uh, the setup to you know produce the beef product variant subsequently you are given a uh, instruction of to produce c uh, units 40 quantity for it so again you will have to do a change over uh, then you are given an instruction to produce 40 units of c so this time you do not have to you know perform a change over so the miniaturized production instruction basically is does not basically rotate all the time so you instead of give, being given uh, the instruction to produce 80 units of c you are basically given two times uh, the instructions twice basically to produce uh, 40 units of c Subse- so this entire loop and now you again you know uh, perform a change over to do Uh, the same cycle 20a 40b 40c and 40c so this loop will you know repeat eight times in a work day in order to basically meet the daily rate of customer demand which is 200 units of a 400b and 800c so this is what load leveling basically entails batch production on the other hand could entail that the production flows in this particular order producing 100 units of a twice then performing a change over to b and then producing 200 units of b twice then performing a change over and then producing 400 units of c twice so with just two change overs this particular process by pursuing batch production produce the entire target uh, which is uh, 200a 400b and 800c so if you were to decide which option is the better one to choose whether the load leveling is the better one or the batch production is the better one to pursue many of you may pursue the batch production way because it's less stressful you do not need to worry about change overs and you can produce the target in larger quantities but it is not the right option because if you were to aspire to have lean in your manufacturing operations then you need to reduce the batch size as much as possible and incorporate more change overs as much as possible although the duration of the change overs needs to be minimized what the benefit of pursuing the lean based you know production leveling approach is that the possibilities of over production excess inventory and other forms of waste is minimized if you pursue this strategy which unfortunately is the bane of batch based production because the processes you know untether themselves from the customer oriented flow which is the ra- their rate of demand instead they work in a siloed manner and uh, per- produce in large quantities independently some of you may have observed a pertinent challenge that would arise if we were to opt for the load leveling approach in this scenario given that production will produce to miniaturized instructions the total number of change overs that would be required to produce the target in full would be totaling 20 and because the time taken for a single change over is 30 minutes the total time spent on change overs during a work day will be a whopping 10 hours and so you will not even be left with enough working time in a day to produce the actual customer demand of 6 uh, 1400 units in a day so this is precisely the reason why reducing or minimizing the change over time is a must for load leveling to function effectively so how do you how does one do so how does one minimize the change over time there are a few ways to do so possibly you can retool the equipment so the time taken for it to set up into manufacturing another variant would be less also uh, just equipment uh, the time taken to set up the equipment is not the only component of change over time there are other component too for example the time it takes for the resource to get ready the time it takes for the necessary materials required to produce another variant to be available at the workstation etc etc so another strategy would be to bring all the necessary parts of uh, machinery as well as the inventory which is required to produce another variant as close to the workstation as possible so that it is it lies in close proximity to the uh, operator and he spends less time on you know bringing it to his workstation so this would also reduce the change over time also sometimes because you are shifting production from producing one variant to another you need to perform certain quality checks to ensure that you know if while producing uh, the possibility of uh, having defective goods is minimized but then these quality checks also basically take consume time and 
this may be a significant component of the change over time as well. So, a potential solution would be to basically uh, mistake proof this particular production process by applying Pokayoke and you can click on the hyperlink to basically uh, read more about what Pokayoke is and besides Pokayoke, you can also opt for you know proactive uh, equipment maintenance so that the need for quality checks also is uh, re reduced over a period of time. Now, uh, an important aspect which uh, I must drive is while some of the ways in which change over time is reduced uh, depends on making certain you know engineering and design changes. However, just by incorporating lean in a pull based value stream, you automatically basically reduce the change over time involved. Because for example, in ACME's future state design, you know that there is a well plus assembly compact workstation which is based on a continuous flow basis. Now what does this mean? Because the operators are seated just beside each other and because the inventory will move very freely as an uninterruptedly between these operators, automatically the change over time for let's say the spot well number 2 or assembly number 2 process would be uh, you know reduced. Also, as you are aware that if in a lean value stream you were to integrate a supermarket pull system or a FIFO lane method of inventory control, some of the upstream processes will be connected to the pacemaker process in a pull based flow. So this implies that if you were to do load leveling at the pacemaker, uh, it would also entail that the instructions are transmitted to the upstream processes in a load leveled format and this would mean that they would also produce all the product variants in a much more even way with a reduced changeover and this implies that the pacemaker process will receive the inventory inputs from the upstream processes in a much quicker way for all the product variants. And what does this mean? It means that the operators will not have to wait for a longer period of time before receiving a particular product variant which it needs as an input to continue manufacturing its own process after performing a changeover to that particular variant. So, uh, you may have this question then what is the way to basically determine the production mix leveling? So, to find the right you know sweet spot where the number of changeovers is also maximized and the uh, you know miniaturized production instructions can also be accommodated. So, the way to do it is to basically uh, you know see how much time is left in the workday after deducting the time that would be spent towards manufacturing the daily production target at the processes cycle time. So, after whatever time that is required to produce, whatever is left, you basically apportion it to changeovers and as and when you basically reduce the changeover time, you basically incorporate more number of changeovers. So, to with if you are able to explain it using that same example discussed before, if the cycle time to produce any of those three variants A or B or C is 30 seconds, then to time taken to produce the total of 1400 units demand, demanded by the customer would be 42,000 seconds which is equivalent to roughly 12 hours and if a workday spans two production shifts with 8 hour each which means that there is 16 hours in a workday this would leave 4 hours for changeovers and because you know that 30 minutes is devoted to a changeover this would leave room for 8 changeovers and the more you reduce the changeover time over a period of time by performing process improvement activities the more number of changeovers you will be able to accommodate in the system. So uh, this highlights the ongoing nature of load leveling and by extent of lean which is based on the principle of continuous improvement. You continuously strive to basically minimize waste, improve productivity and so on and so forth. However, because in a value stream map, uh, the, you know the continuous improvement does need to happen but there is a timeline attached to it because the future state needs to occur at a particular point in time. So, by that time you basically have to get your organization, your manufacturing processes and everything ready to basically produce as per the lean guidelines. So, in order to do so, just purely continuous improvement wouldn't do. What would be required is continuous improvement within a rapid timeline. So, instead of Kaizen which is the synonym, a Japanese word for you know uh, continuous improvement, you basically perform a Kaizen burst which is the subject of our next topic of process improvement. While we have determined the quantity and distribution of production instructions using load leveling, remind yourself of the supermarket pull system discussed previously, where production was only triggered by actual consumption by the downstream manufacturing process. 
Now, technically, there is no downstream manufacturing process after the pacemaker process, which basically receives the load level instructions. And because the pacemaker process is the farthest downstream manufacturing process in a traditional manufacturing organization, it basically cannot trigger withdrawal instructions in any way possible. So, we have to artificially induce a withdrawal instruction basically. Because shipping, which is the last process technically in an organization's value stream, does not have a you know consumption rate as such. It basically just has to accumulate enough finished products during the day so that the dispatch vehicle can be filled as per the timeline. So, the technique to do the artificial you know inducement of withdrawal is known as paste withdrawal and we will explore the signaling device known as load leveling box which is used to facilitate this particular technique of paste withdrawal. In this depiction you can see a load leveling box with the withdrawal bands sorted at pitch intervals. On the y axis lies the name of the three products in the product family A, B and C. On the x-axis lies the time of the workday, arranged at pitch increments and pitch as you know it is usually a function of tuck time multiplied by the customer's pack size or a fun, uh, you can say a multiple or a uh, division or an equivalent of it basically. In this depiction, the pitch is 10 minutes as is evident from the timeline increments. What essentially this signals is that after every interval of 10 minutes, another variant of the product family has to be manufactured after performing the changeover that is. A load leveling box stores sequenced inventory withdrawal instructions for the shipping department for the entire workday. So how to use this load leveling box? Imagine that before the workday begins, the centralized production control department arranges withdrawal Kanban cards in the hollow cells of the box as per the load leveling sequence it has determined. Paste withdrawal is initiated when material handler picks up the 8am product A withdrawal Kanban card from the box and submits it to the finished goods supermarket. So essentially because the pitch increment is 10 minutes, one production, uh, one withdrawal Kanban card is equivalent to a uh, quantity which is which can be manufactured in those 10 minutes. So, assuming that let us say one product is manufactured in a minute, then 10 in 10 minutes, 10 products are manufactured. So, one withdrawal Kanban card is a signal to the supermarket to give to the material handler 10 pieces of inventory, finished goods inventory, which the material handler will take to the staging area of shipping department and keep it over there. At the supermarket end, because the inventory is reduced by 10 units, it will print a production Kanban card. So, this production Kanban card serves as a miniaturized production instruction to the pacemaker process that please manufacture, you know, 10 minutes worth of goods because I need it as my inventory in the supermarket is diminished by this quantity. So, what happens is this is the way the pacemaker process receives the instruction. So, it does not directly receive the instruction from production control, but production control has triggered an artificial withdrawal of inventory, which basically triggers the production instructions being supplied to the pacemaker process in a load leveling sequence, which is the entire objective of utilizing load leveling in conjunction with the paste withdrawal technique. So, at ACME, how do we pursue load leveling and paste withdrawal? At ACME, the tuck time is 60 seconds, whereas the customer's pack size is one tray, which is equivalent to 20 finished brackets. Now, 20 minutes into the tuck time of one minute or 60 seconds gives us 20 minutes of pitch. And this particular figure is both a miniature quantity as well as a practical quantity of production instruction. Hence, it will be adopted in the future state design. Leveling of production volume will entail releasing production instructions in this pitch interval determined, which is at increments of 20 minutes, which is equivalent to 
you know one withdrawal kanban card equals to 20 brackets worth of production instructions in terms of leveling the production mix you know that the ratio of state steel's demand for finished brackets is roughly 2 is to 1 for the product family which is 600 units of left hand drive brackets and 320 units of right hand drive brackets hence the mix by itself will be determined in this format itself which is one of rh drive bracket to be produced then subsequently two units of lh drive to be produced and this loop basically continues so in between rh and lh obviously there is a changeover so by you know uh, concurrently if we were to apply both of them together that is volume leveling and mix leveling the production flow at acme would look appear in this format which is first it will receive a production instruction of making 20 rh drive brackets subsequently an instruction of making 20 lh drive brackets which automatically implies that it has to perform a changeover subsequently once again it will receive an instruction of making the same lh brackets 20 units of it and then this loop will continue until the entire daily customer demand of 920 finished brackets across both the production shifts is completed so if this loop were to continue a sum total of 15 changeovers would be required for the spot welding operation this is because spot welding operation has a changeover time whereas assembly operation in the pacemaker process which is a continuous flow process the assembly operation does not have you know a changeover time so because the time taken for changeover is uh, you, you, uh, you can say 10 minutes, a total of 150 minutes or 2.5 hours will be required by the spot welder to perform changeovers in a workday, which is the number of changeovers is 15, which it has to uh, produce. So, does the question is, does Acme's production have this much time to spare for, you know, a total of 2.5 hours in the workday? So, assuming that the cycle time of weld plus assembly process will be, you know, at least equal to the tuck time of 60 seconds, manufacturing 920 finished brackets at this pace will naturally exhaust all of its available work time, which is uh, 55,200 seconds across both the production shifts. Therefore, what ACME would need to do is either it increases the pace of production of this pacemaker process to 50 seconds per finished bracket. So, why, how has this been determined? Because you will need two and a half hours of changeover time. This means 9000 seconds. So, deducting 9000 seconds from 55,200 seconds of available work time and dividing the balance time with the daily demand of customer, which is 920 brackets, translates to 50 seconds per finished bracket. So, either instead of producing to tuck the process basically produces 10 seconds quicker so that adequate time is left for making those 15 changeovers the second option is for this pacemaker process to eliminate the changeover time of welding which is 10 minutes per changeover completely so if changeover time does not exist then this particular process can continue producing at you know the tuck of 60 seconds and it can basically fulfill every aspect of production as per the demand of the uh, demand rate of the customer and the third option is basically a trade off between the two that uh, you know it basically works towards increasing the cycle time of the process as well as works towards diminishing or reducing the uh, changeover time of the uh, pacemaker process as well so what acme has decided to pursue we will discuss it shortly but meanwhile as for the mechanism of the paste withdrawal, the withdrawal Kanban cards can be drawn by the material handler at the pitch increment of 20 minutes, which we had determined from the load level. So this is a revised depiction of the load leveling box as for Acme's future state design, wherein the two types of product variants are mentioned on the y-axis and the withdrawal Kanban cards are arranged in a load leveling sequence which is basically at a 20 minutes increment where one withdrawal card, a carbon card is equivalent to an instruction 
to basically uh, you know uh, take away one tray worth of finished brackets from the finished goods supermarket which will subsequently induce a production instruction of making a new set of 20 brackets for the pacemaker well plus assembly continuous flow workstation let me remind you how far have we progressed in our quest to make the future state value stream of acme we started off by spotting the bottleneck process assembly number 1 subsequently we figured that four processes from spot weld 1 to assembly 2 would be compatible with continuous flow thereafter we determined that three supermarket pull systems can be used to regulate the inventory that stagnates in the value stream currently at acme that of steel coils stamp brackets and of finished brackets in the previous topic we also identified the pitch to be 20 minutes as well as determined that acme would need to incorporate 15 changeovers in a workday as part of the load leveling load leveling application during our journey you may recollect that i had indicated to you a couple of times that acme would need to make a few process improvements for the future state designed to work seamlessly so let's get to it in general there are two ways to identify which processes need improvements one is by spotting inefficiencies in the current state and then once the future state design is ready we see whether where there is a scope to fine tune the processes further an example of the former is when we had determined that assembly number 1 process was the bottleneck and that it would need to cycle 2 seconds quickly in order to align itself with the start time of 60 seconds when it comes to process improvements because there is a timeline associated with future state implementation the improvements that are necessary in order to make the future state design work seamlessly needs to be occurring in a rapid manner so there is a word known as blitz or continuous improvement blitz which basically needs to occur and there is a concept note where we will explore this particular topic so continuous improvement blitz is also known as a kaizen burst so these japanese origin lean terminology such as kanban haijunka kaizen may appear overwhelming but uh, in reality these are very pragmatic concepts as you may also concur so kaizen burst is a hybrid between two techniques one is kaizen and the other one is kaikaku so what is kaizen so processes that are earmarked for kaizen are to be incrementally improved over a long time horizon so there are two characteristics that are emphasized one is the nature of improvement is incremental in nature as well as the horizon for making this particular improvement is long enough so imagine that a manufacturer wants to increase the energy efficiency of its boiling manufacturing process and let's say it has determined that it is targeting to improve this process by 10% over the next year so it's a significantly long horizon and the company will basically try to achieve this end goal by targeting small improvements of let's say 1% improvement in the energy efficiency each month by making very moderate changes not wholesome you know uh, ultra uh, you can say radical changes so moderate changes meaning better temperature controls equipment maintenance altering the material composition of the input slightly and so on and so forth on the other hand processes that are earmarked for kaikaku is to be radically improved in a shorter time horizon so the two characteristics are radical nature of improvement as well as the shorter time horizon of making this particular improvement so imagine that a manufacturer wants to increase the output of a particular process by 40% in order to meet anticipated surge in customer demand over the next quarter so because it is done over the next quarter the time horizon is relatively small so a project team will need to be set up to find a viable solution because the extent of improvement is quite significant which is 40% so a wholehearted dedicated project team is set up 
to find a viable solution and the approach undertaken is also intensive and high priority and the percent potential type of you know solutions that could have been determined would be to procure new capital equipment or let's say increase the duration of a production shift or addition of another shift or let's say outsourcing the production to other manufacturers so the nature of this improvement is also radical in nature so this basically highlights to you what is a kaizen and what is a kaikaku now what a kaizen burst is, is is a hybrid of the two so it takes in a way the best of both the worlds so basically the processes need to be incrementally improved in a kaizen burst but then the nature of the improvement is not radical it is basically incremental The burst in Kaizen burst signifies that an event will be scheduled to make this incremental process improvement happen. The duration of this event typically does not exceed a week, which signals the high priority nature of this intervention. Usually, a task force is set up, which is a motley group of individuals comprising process operators, R&D members from the leadership, and so on, who basically come together and collaborate in mission mode. to achieve the process improvement target which typically is moderate in nature as in not you know exceeding 20% and the way to achieve this change is also iterative and could be innovative but it is certainly not by making some radical changes to how the process works some of the potential ways in which improvement targets can be achieved incrementally but in a short time frame are by retooling an equipment so that it can change over in minimal time to produce a new variant or it could be done by training the workforce so that they can let's say produce with fewer defects if that is the objective of process improvement target or one can also redesign the workstation so that the operations become quicker and you know uh, less error prone and one an- another way could be to basically maintain the equipment uh, productive maintenance so that it basically ba- doesn't break down as moving on to acme's value stream design uh, we will need to figure where to introduce kaizen bursts in the future state acme only has two discrete manufacturing processes one is the weld plus assembly continuous flow workstation and the other one is the stamping process because weld plus assembly is the pace maker which is essentially you know it sets the pace of production for the upstream processes as well as because it lies closest to the customer acme will need to specially attend to basically fine tune this particular process because a whole lot of aspects hinge on whether this particular process is cycling at a proper pace at which the customer is demanding the finished brackets output in terms of the factual information of the weld plus assembly workstation it has a total you can say work duration of 187 seconds which is nothing but a sum total of the individual cycle times of the four processes from spot weld 1 to assembly number 2 in the current state this translates to an average work duration of 40 seconds 47 seconds per operator so which inherently signals to us that you know on an average this operation could be much pacier than that however in reality it is not the case because the operation of this workstation is determined by the longest process which is assembly one which is actually uh, much uh, you know uh, slightly slower than that so we need to improve this particular process so that you know at least the workstation cycles at least as at the pace of that of 60 seconds per finished bracket now additionally from the load leveling section you would recollect that we had also identified that the welding process would need to incorporate 15 changeovers within its available work time in a working day so in order to do so we had shortlisted three options one was to cycle the welding process at 10 seconds quicker than tap that is at 50 seconds or to eliminate the changeover time of 10 minutes completely or an iteration involving improvements in both the point a and point b now an iteration is a much more balanced approach because with uh, by reducing cycle time by by 10 seconds acme risks falling into the trap of overproduction because it is untethering the welding process from you know the customer oriented flow which is 60 seconds per finished bracket which would result in a loss of tap image also 
eliminating the change over time completely is also not a feasible thing i mean how would you basically eliminate a change over time completely you would still incur at least a few seconds to basically perform the change over so uh, in this case both point a and point b does not seem reasonable so an iteration involving both reducing the cycle time as well as uh, reducing the change over time is what we will uh, kind of target to pursue so let's move to the first uh, process improvement which we have identified that is to increase the reliability of spot weld number 2 equipment now spot weld number 2 equipment is basically part of the weld plus assembly pacemaker process and uh, you know you are aware that the reliability of the continuous flow workstation is dependent that you know all the process operations within synchronize perfectly now from the current state map you have noticed that uptime of spot weld number 2 is 80% which means there is a downtime of 20% as in historically the equipment doesn't work properly for 20% of the time which renders this process inefficient for that period of time. So we will have to ensure that we improve the efficiency by uh, you know eliminating the downtime as much as possible. Fortunately ACME has determined that by applying ma better maintenance techniques downtime of well number 2 equipment can be eliminated completely. Secondly, we will also have to reduce the change over time of welding equipment from 10 minutes. Now ACME feels that it will be able to eliminate 99% of the weld change over time during the Kanban burst event. That is, it will be able to restrict the change over time to just a few seconds in the future state from the existing of 10 minutes. It has two solid reasons to believe why this can be possible. Firstly, because it has made a significant design change which is to install a supermarket between stamping and the pacemaker process, this automatically entails that the stamped brackets move closer to the welding operator. Therefore, it will basically reduce a certain portion of the change over time. Moreover, the welder is also assured of a steady supply of both the bracket variants because if you recollect, the way the production instructions were to be transmitted to the supermarket uh, to the stamping process would entail that stamping would make every bracket every shift that is it will make rh and lh brackets in a single production shift which would basically guarantee a steady supply of inventory inputs therefore by doing installing a supermarket the waste that no normally goes into waiting for the material inputs stands to get reduced to a certain extent which will impact the change over time. Secondly, ACME also plans to redesign the continuous flow workstation. So in the future state design, uh, we had already identified that ACME will load the stamped brackets in the continuous flow workstation itself in small plastic bins that can hold 60 stamped brackets. Now, these bins will be loaded on gravity feed racks. So, this is the change which ACME plans to make. Within, so, the, these gravity feed racks basically will have allow the operators to have convenient and rapid access to their inputs. You can click on the gravity feed rack hyperlink to see how it looks like and this would help you understand why uh, ACME's operators, the spot welders that is, stand to benefit and eliminate a significant portion of change over time by installing this uh, di uh, bracket dispensing mechanism within the continuous flow workstation. That being said, uh, you may have spotted a challenge which is that the stamping process upstream has a high change over time of one hour. Now our process improvement for well plus assembly hinged on the fact that stamping would be able to supply the products in a quicker manner to it. Now, because there is a high change over time, our uh, assumption needs to be questioned. So, before even further improving the weld plus assembly process, let us try to see uh, whether there is a scope for performing a Kaizen burst for reducing the change over time for stamping. Know that the change over time spent by stamping is not restricted to just switching from left hand to right hand drive bracket variants and vice versa alone. It is also spent in switching from manufacturing another product family 
to switching over to manufacturing the bracket product family as well because stamping is not a dedicated process. Now, Acme is fortunately confident that it will be able to reduce the change over time of the stamping process drastically during the Kanban burst event. It anticipates to reduce it to 10 minutes per changeover which is a significant 83% improvement and this is possible because of two reasons. Firstly, the way to reduce the setup time of the stamping press equipment by retooling it is well known in the industry and Acme can take advantage of it to reduce the changeover time. Also, because of the design change made which is to install a raw material supermarket, Acme's stamping process will also have a steady supply of the steel coil raw material whenever it needs to perform a changeover into manufacturing the stamped brackets. This was not the case earlier because it had to wait for a longer duration for the steel coils to arrive from the Michigan Steel, the supplier of raw material. Now that we know that the efficiency of the pacemaker process will not be compromised as the stamping process will improve its changeover time and ensure a steady supply of both the variants of stamped brackets, we can now proceed to finalize the scope for the fourth and final Kaizen Burst initiative. And no, this is not restricted to reducing the cycle time of assembly one process by two seconds to align it with the tact of 60 seconds. We had already computed that the average work duration to manufacture one bracket for each operator in this continuous flow process is anticipated to be roughly 47 seconds, which is derived by dividing the total cycle time of 187 seconds by the four operators in this process. If you compare it with the tat of 60 seconds per bracket, this should trigger you. Will the operator resources be underutilized in this continuous flow workstation? Let's test out this hypothesis. Assume that you take out one operator from this workstation. So now there are three operators who will perform the four operations within. So uh, it will mean that welder number one will not only do welding number one process but also a little portion of welding number two process whereas welder number two will not only do welding number two process but a little portion of the assembly one process. Now each of these processes are not very technical in nature so we can assume that you know these operators can be trained to perform on a new equipment during the Kaizen burst event. So uh, by removing uh, operator the average work duration, which is 187 seconds, divided by three operators now becomes 63 seconds. So, the while this overshoots that by three seconds, but then the operator resources are being utilized much more effectively right now. Moreover, Acme feels that certain benefits will accrue from having designed a lean value stream that will positively adjust the total work duration. For example, the continuous flow workstation will be a compact and a collaborative workspace where the operators will be located in close proximity to all the inventory as well as parts necessary to operate without inconvenience. Also, the positive impact from the previous Kaizen Burst initiatives has not yet been accounted for. So, the improvement in the downtime, the removal of the changeover time, etc., will also positively impact the efficiency of the uh, weld plus assembly pacemaker process. Therefore, Acme has estimated that it will be able to reduce the total work duration in the pacemaker process by adopting a Kaizen burst initiative by 10%. So, the total work duration which is currently 187 seconds, Acme anticipates that by having a Kaizen burst it can target to limit it to not more than 168 seconds, which becomes our fourth and final Kaizen Burst initiative. Now, to conclude this particular section, while I must say that while these rapid process improvement initiatives will only last for a week in the future state and ACME will aspire to basically get the uh, improvements done so as to quickly transition into its future state design. However, the state of incremental process improvements using normal Kaizen, not a Kaizen burst, will continue even after. As a lean manufacturer should strive to be on a path of continuous improvement, having a steadfast commitment to 
eliminate waste from the system as well as heighten the productivity levels. With this, we come to the conclusion of the section on future state design of ACME's value stream. In this visual, you can see how ACME's changes which it made to its current state value stream corresponds to the eight key questions for future state design, which is nothing but the guidelines for lean manufacturing. You may pause the video over here to see the summary. While implementation of the future state design will be the key, ACME has laid the foundation for a high performance manufacturing flow by designing this according to lean guidelines. If everything goes to plan, ACME can reduce the production lead time to 5 days from the existing of 23.6 days, which is a startling 80% improvement. Another way to observe the benefit that will be derived from this lean value stream is by seeing how quickly the bracket inventory can be flipped into sales, that is the inventory turnover computation. In the future state, the production lead time from the pacemaker process to shipping, that is from issuing a production instruction to the weld plus assembly into shipping the finished brackets to state steel is two days. This means that from the point ACME decides to produce a bracket, it can be assured that the maximum duration a bracket will reside in the value stream will be just two days. This is a significant benefit as now ACME will realize its production investments quicker, respond to changing customer requirements faster, have lesser reliance on working capital, will be able to postpone its production to a greater extent and so on. Thus, with careful implementation, ACME will now be able to reduce its brackets with the shortest possible production lead time the brackets will be of the highest quality and will be manufactured at the lowest cost and will have a very dependable delivery. The TWI Industries case is more advanced than ACME. However, it does a very nice job of presenting a contrasting situation and the methodology of dealing with the inefficiencies is also a bit different. Overall, with the ACME and TWI Industries cases, your exposure and understanding of value stream mapping will be significant. Like ACME, TWI also manufactures automotive components. The product family in concern is steering arms, which is basically a part used in tractors. It is not uh, complicated to manufacture as such and the manufacturing steps are also not that difficult to comprehend. This is how a steering arm looks like. It is basically a metal rod with forged fittings at either end. I will explain this case using a similar structure that I had used to ac explain ACME case both in this video as well as in the article so that it will facilitate your understanding and for comparison purposes as well. I would suggest that you download the maps onto your system. The link is mentioned in the video description. And you may also benefit from having the value stream mapping article handy on a different tab as well so that you can refer to the concept notes and methodology as I will not deep dive into it in this stretch of the video. I would have liked to include the TWI case explanation in the article itself but I had reached my blog's word limit and I did not want to split the article into two uh, different articles. Let's begin. In terms of product characteristics and production configuration, Unlike Acme's steel brackets, which was a make-to-stock business, TWI's tearing arms is a make-to-order business, which means that besides raw material procurement and production engineering, all the other production steps such as fabrication and assembly are initiated only after the customer confirms his order. The product family comprises 240 different production configurations, and so one wouldn't be wrong if it brands the operations as customized manufacturing. The number of customers for the steering arms are also several and they belong to one of these two categories, either original equipment manufacturers, that is the manufacturers of new tractors or aftermarket customers, that is garages that may replace damaged steering arms in tractors. 
from the shipping department we've gathered that the customer places an order for 24000 pieces of steering arms every month and the average customer order is for 50 pieces while this information is not present on the map it is important to make note of it as we shall make use of this data point in TWI's future state design. The steering arms are dispatched in corrugated boxes which can hold up to 5 steering arms. The key aspect for you to remember is that unlike ACME where one tray held exactly 20 brackets which proved to be a useful pack size reference for us, in TWI's case the up to 5 arms implies that while the pack size is definitely a box but the quantity of pack size is not fixed. Thus, utilizing the pack size as a metric to determine the pitch may be tricky. We will see when we come to it. As the customers are several, outbound transportation occurs multiple times in a day. Typically, TWI's customers operate their plants on a two production shift per day basis. In terms of the manufacturing operations, don't be overawed by the map, it is not that complicated. Let me take you through the sequence. There are six manufacturing processes. First, the metal rods are cut and moved to welding, where the end fittings are attached at either end of the arm across these two processes. The sockets where these end fittings will be welded are also machined within TWI's plant. Hence, as you can see here, the machining process supplies the machined sockets to both the welding processes in parallel. Subsequently, deflash processes is done, which is nothing but a machined removal of excess weldment. Subsequently, the welded rods are painted, albeit at an external vendor, where this process is outsourced. This kind of process wasn't present in ACME's case, as you may be aware and we have depicted it on the map as it is a vital manufacturing process and certainly lies within TWI's scope of direct influence. If this step was done at some other plant belonging to TWI itself, we would still depict it as a separate process box. The painted rods return to TWI's plant in two days time and subsequently uh, the assembly process assembles the end fittings on the arm to complete the manufacturing of finished tearing arms which are moved to staging area belonging to the shipping department before being shipped to the customer. As for the data boxes, three metrics are present, cycle time, changeover time and uptime are being captured. Wherever the cycle time is split between man and machine, it implies that the operator loads and unloads the inventory to and from the equipment and this time is separately denoted. Whereas the machine cycle time is the rate at which the equipment in the process releases one new processed inventory output. The changeover time is also denoted as 15 to 60 minutes because performing a switch in the rod length takes 15 minutes of changeover whereas performing a switch in the rod diameter takes 60 minutes. The 240 number of product variants which I indicated to you earlier was actually derived by multiplying TWI's steering arm options ranging from 20 different lengths, 2 diameters and with 3 different types of end fittings where each end of the steering arm can have a different fitting. The inventory that stagnates before each process is also depicted and you can pause the video here in case you wish to study it. Also, observe the number of operators for each process if you would wish to. At the supplier end of the value stream, there are two categories of suppliers. A rod supplier called Michigan Steel, which was the same at ACME, and a forged fitting supplier called Indiana Castings. Both of them supply their respective raw material consignments to TWI's plant twice a month. That being said, the lead time is quite long, at 16 and 12 weeks respectively for rods and fittings. Lead time means the time it takes to place an order and receiving the consignment. While we have not depicted this information on the map, we will have to take it into consideration during the future state design as this characteristic contributes significantly to TWI's production lead time as well. So it is important to document this important fact separately even if we choose not to depict it on the value stream map 
as such. To summarize the information present in the timeline segment, the production lead time total is quite high at 48 days, whereas the processing or value added time total is quite tiny by comparison, just a shade above, uh, just a shade, shade above 5 minutes. Bulk of the lead time is consumed in raw material inventory. This is easy to comprehend why, because the suppliers take long to fulfill the order. TWI has to maintain a large quantity of excess inventory to be utilized by production till the time the next consignment carrying new inventory is received. TWI operates its plant 20 days a month and two production shifts in a day. Given that one production shift lasts 8 hours and there is 30 minutes of break time during a shift, the available working time per shift can be computed to 27,000 seconds. This information, unlike in ACME's case, is not uh, mentioned on the map, but it will still be useful uh, later, uh, especially to compute the tuck time. As for the information flows, ACME asks its customers to place their orders 60 days prior to their desired date of delivery. That is, the customer's lead time is 60 days. Uh, it is a large figure because of TWI's own long production lead time and because of the fact that it has a lot of unfulfilled customer orders to attend to as well, as TWI's customers make the proverbial last minute changes to their orders. Currently, TWI entertains changes to orders a maximum of two weeks from the date of dispatch. Because the customer requirements are very varied, even within a single order, TWI resorts to batch manufacturing, where same product configurations of steering arms spread across multiple customer orders are combined and issued as a shop order to the manufacturing processes so as to prevent the number of changeovers to be performed. Shop order is nothing but a production schedule, that is a large production target. While it is not specified on the map, the shop orders come with a deadline of 6 weeks. That is, the entire production target needs to be completed in 48 days time, which is nearly double the time that a steering arm spends in manufacturing. Why this early release of shop order, you may wonder? It is done so as to enable production control to place new rod and forgings raw material orders with the suppliers who take a long lead time to supply it as I had already indicated to you earlier. After all, TWI's excess inventory of raw material would last only for 20 days and it is important for it to replenish it in the next fortnightly consignment that comes from the supplier. TWI issues a daily shipping schedule to the shipping department, just like ACME did. Additionally, TWI keeps production supervisors whose role is to expedite orders and work on priority order fulfillment lists issued by production control. With this, we come to the conclusion of the interpretation of TWI's current state uh, map. I hope you have formed a good idea of how the operations work as of today at TWI Industries. Can you spot some waste and inefficiencies? What kind of changes would you like to make to TWI's current state design? Pause the video here if you'd like to. To reiterate, the explanation of TWI's future state design will be structured in the same way as that of ACMAZE in the article as well as in the video previously. This will enable you to grasp the occurrences better. So let's begin by spotting the bottleneck process first. To identify it, TWI would need to compute TAKT and then compare it with the cycle time of the various manufacturing processes. 24,000 units of monthly steering arms demand translates to a daily demand rate of 1200 units and a per production shift demand rate of 600 units. I had already mentioned to you that the available working time in a production shift is 27,000 seconds. Thus, the tuck time is 27,000 seconds divided by 600 steering arms, which is equal to 45 seconds. Now comparing it with the various cycle times, 
we can see that all the processes are pacing about at a faster pace than Takht. Assembly's total cycle time of 195 seconds is basically the total work time per piece across the six operators in this equipment-less process. So, on a per operator basis, the average work time is 32.5 seconds. Assuming that individual operator work times do not deviate much from the average and certainly not above that, we can conclude that there is no bottleneck process in TWI's current state. This is good news, although this could signal overproduction and underutilization of resources. So, TWI will need to be wary of that. Moving on, let's identify the steps conducive to be linked with continuous flow from right to left in, in the map, that is from the downstream customer facing process to upstream. So let's begin with the downstream equipment-less assembly process first. Having all the six operators seated together in a compact workstation with a one-piece flow would enable TWI to eliminate the changeover time of 10 minutes completely that occurs currently at this juncture due to the operators producing in batches in a comparatively spread out work zone. Also, the total work time for the six operators here in a production shift can be computed as 195 seconds of work time into 600 steering arms, which is equal to 32 and a half hours or 4.33 man days, given that one man day has 7.5 hours of available working time. Thus, it is also possible to reallocate the work elements and run this process with five operators, that is, with one operator less an attractive proposition which TWI will choose to avail. Besides, since this is the closest manufacturing process to the customer, it should clock as close to Takht as possible. With five operators, as there will be no change over time in this operation, it is worthwhile to slow down this process to the Takht of 45 seconds, that is, increase the total work time by 30 seconds to 225 seconds. This would translate to 4.73 man days of work by 5 operators, which is still viable. But is there a scope to expand this continuous flow upstream? Very easy to rule out this possibility as the painting process is outsourced to another location. Hence, the continuous flow would reside within assembly only. Moving further upstream, notice that each of D flash Weld number 2 and weld number 1 have similar cycle times and technically speaking form a part of the same welding theme as such, as D-flash is nothing but a removal of excess weldment. Hence, linking these processes in a continuous flow workstation is an at attractive possibility too, especially considering that in a compact workstation, the manual time it takes to load and unload inventory from the equipment can be minimized. Another compelling aspect is that the total manual work time for these three processes in a production shift in the current state is 600 units into 10 seconds into the three operators, that is 18,000 seconds or 5 hours, which is significantly less than the available working time in a shift of 7.5 hours. Hence, to keep three operators is a massive underutilization of resources and can be certainly done away with in a compact continuous flow workstation. TWI can easily manage to run this joint operation with just one operator, whose only role will be to load and unload inventory from the three equipments within. Meanwhile, cutting process is cycling at a much faster pace than weld plus D flash as well as Takht, and this would contribute to stagnating inventory if it were to be linked with the weld plus D flash continuous flow workstation as is. Moreover, cutting is a pretty basic operation and slowing the cutting equipment down nearly three times to match the takt is also of no value, particularly because it is so far from the end customer in the value stream. Besides, cutting process has no manufacturing predecessors to be mindful of as well. And hence, TWI has decided to allow cutting to cycle at the same pace as it is currently in the future state as well. Machining of forged sockets is just an ancillary component to the steering arms' production sequence. So, linking it to weld plus D flashes 
continuous flow will not be of any value either. Meanwhile, having a separate continuous flow workstation for the cut and machining processes is not viable either. As not only are both these processes non-sequential, but also they have nothing in common in terms of their respective technical operation. Hence, the continuous flow between the two is also not a possibility. So now we are left with seven junctures in the value stream where we have to regulate inventory stagnation and move from push based batch production to pull based lean production. Which alternative flow strategy can we apply and where? Straight away, what should trigger you is that TWI, unlike Acme, has numerous products in its product family, precisely 240 different customizations. Keeping working inventory for each of them in a supermarket format is not tenable. Hence, FIFO Lane is the alternative viable choice for inventory regulation. But should FIFO Lane be applied across all the seven remaining junctures? Yeah. The answer is no, because the numerous product variations materialize only after the welding step. Hence, the supermarket pull system can be a better alternative for inventory regulation than FIFO Lane at the following junctures. For both the types of raw materials, which is rods and forge fittings, as well as for cut rods and machined sockets. Is there anything else that we should consider before finalizing this choice though? The answer is yes. In its pure form, supermarkets keep low working inventory and have quick inventory replenishment time. However, as you can observe, the replenishment time for raw material is very high at 20 days, which has its negative impact on the lead time downstream in the value stream as well. Hence, to make supermarket format viable at these junctures, TWI would need to keep higher quantity of working inventory, which would in turn be influenced by the inbound transportation lead time. Hence, it is a priority for TWI to negotiate for increased frequency of raw material delivery from the two suppliers. TWI believes that it can persuade the suppliers to deliver raw material in weekly consignments in the future state timeline envisaged. This would not only help TWI to have less inventory at these raw material, that is at the rod and forge fitting supermarkets, but also it would also have a drastic improvement in the quantum of working inventory to be kept at their two supermarkets downstream as well as they'd be assured of a steady supply of cut rods and machined sockets. Due to weekly consignments from raw material suppliers, TWI will need to keep an equivalent working inventory at the raw material supermarkets, that is 7 days worth. At the downstream supermarkets, that is at the cut rods and machined sockets supermarkets, the working inventory can be kept at a bare minimum, that is a single work day's worth as it is assured of a steady supply of inventory from the cut and machining processes which benefit from the presence of raw material supermarkets. Moving on, since the onset of customization occurs at welding process, it will serve as the ideal scheduling point for production control to issue the production instructions, that is the pacemaker of TWI's future state design. This is in contrast to the standard way of designating a pacemaker, which tends to be the most downstream manufacturing process. TWI case is an ex exemption exception in that it is important for it to exercise control over production at an earlier juncture, that is before the customization sets in, so that changes to customer orders, a practice that is highly prevalent for the steering arms product family at TWI will have a less adverse impact on production. Meanwhile, the FIFO lane from well plus D-flash to shipping will have a holding capacity of 1200 units, the quantity that exactly matches TWI's daily steering arms' demand rate. As TWI schedules only one shipment of D-flash steering arms to the outside paint supplier in a workday as of today and in the future as well, it is thereby assured that well plus D flash will not be called upon to produce more than 1200 units or one day's production lead time worth of welded arms 
in a single workday. Hence, eliminated, eliminating the possibility of overproduction. This effect will continue further downstream as well. FIFO lane procedure would dictate that the painted arms are dispatched from the external paint supplier in a single consignment on a daily basis and emptied at TWIZ's assembly process, thereby implying that assembly will not receive inventory inputs exceeding 1200 units in a single workday either, that is one day production lead time worth of painted steering arms. From assembly to shipping, the FIFO lane parameters will persist. The material will be produced and transferred to staging as per the customer orders. Thus, unlike ACME, which was better suited to deploy a finished goods supermarket, TWI can produce directly to staging, which is indirectly the shipping process. At the staging area, among other aspects, the arms will be sorted and clubbed as per the customer orders before being shipped. Overall, due to production mix leveling, the customer orders are anticipated to be fulfilled in more or less the same sequence as it was received by TWI. In terms of load leveling now, uh, TWI has to decide the production volume leveling strategy first. TWI has decided to set the pitch as 30 minutes, that is, a miniaturized production instruction to manufacture 40 units of a particular variant of steering arms if the pacemaker were to produce at the pace of takt, that is 45 seconds. Pitch is typically equal to takt time into either the customer's pack size or MOQ, which is minimum order quantity, or the average order size. At TWI, the pack size is a corrugated box which can hold up to 5 steering arms. Additional information obtained from the plant was that the customer order ranges from 25 to 200 pieces of steering arms with an average order size of 50 pieces, which is equivalent to 10 corrugated boxes. Multiplying the takt by the pack size, we get 3.75 minutes of production instruction, which is a small quantity accepted that, but it is not a practical instruction. Therefore, TWI has considered to scale this value up. The next whole numbers in the sequence are 15 minutes, which is 3.75 minutes into 4, or 30 minutes, which is 3.75 into 8, or 45 minutes, which is 3.75 into 12. Making the average order size of 50 brackets would take 37.5 minutes at Takht, which is exactly between the second and third option. The eventual selection of 30 minutes by TWI is made based on it being more a more practical instruction than the 45 minutes. By having a pitch based production instruction ensures that well plus D flash does not resort to push based manufacturing of steering arms that is batch manufacturing of steering arms. Moving on to the production mix leveling strategy. A major aspect to consider is that there are multiple variants, exactly 240, emanating from the pacemaker process. Having an every part every, that is an EPE of a production shift or a work, even a workday is not going to work at TWI, as that would entail a minimum of 239 changeovers to be performed in a shift or in a workday. Simply impossible. Nonetheless, TWI will target to systematize the production from the currently uh, reactionary ways at TWI. To begin with, TWI will target an EPE, which is an every part every, of 10 days. This would mean that it would have to perform 24 changeovers in a day, which is equal to 12 changeovers in a production shift. Even then, at the current changeover duration of one hour, having 12 changeovers would imply 12 hours spent on it in a shift of 7.5 hours of working time, which is again simply impossible. Which is why Lean endorses minimizing the changeover time between producing variants in a product family.
Well plus D flash stands to benefit from the steady supply of inventory inputs from the supermarket driven processes upstream who in turn benefit from the suppliers is much faster delivery frequency of the raw material. Hence TWI is targeting to reduce the change over time to 5 minutes which will be a Kaizen burst that is a rapid process improvement initiative for it. Assuming that TWI manages to reach this milestone, it would still need to accelerate the cycle time of this process by 1 second from the existing 40 seconds to 39 seconds in the future state. This would enable TWI to complete its manufacturing target of 600 steering arms in a shift in 23,400 seconds leaving 3600 or exactly one hour for performing the 12 changeovers at 5 minutes per changeover. Just by virtue of being a compact continuous flow workstation which receives a steady supply of inventory inputs, making a process improvement of one second boost in cycle time will be relatively straightforward for TWI. That's not all though. TWI will have to undertake one more rapid process initiative at the pacemaker process which is to improve the reliability that is the uptime percentage of both the welding processes to 100%. This is a necessity as all the operations within the continuous flow link process needs to synchronize perfectly and for that to happen complete process reliability for all the processes involved is a must. As was the case in ACME, better maintenance for the welding machine during the Kaizen burst event should accomplish this target for TWI. Besides these three rapid process improvements at the pacemaker process, in order to ensure a steady supply of inventory to it, TWI would also need to undertake two more Kaizen bursts to reduce the changeover time of the cut as well as the machining process. The cutting process by itself is not a very technical operation, so reducing its change over time drastically by retooling the equipment is entirely feasible. TWI has determined that it can target to reduce cutting's change over time to 5 minutes during the Kaizen burst event. Machining of forged end fitting sockets comparatively is a more technical operation. Nonetheless, TWI has determined that it can target to reduce the change over time significantly to 30 minutes, that is a 75% improvement during the Kaizen burst event. Making these changes in the value stream will incorporate lean into the material flows of TWI. As a result, the lead time from receiving an order to producing finished tearing arms will be reduced to under 3 days. Thereby, ACME can now proceed to redesign its information flows accordingly. You are already aware about the pitch increment of 30 minutes, which will eliminate the need for production scheduling and expediters, which is the addi um, additional manpower basically in the current state value stream. Keeping in consideration that the raw materials is delivery lead time as well, TWI has determined that it will be able to deliver customer orders now in two weeks time, now as in in the future state, which would be a 76% improvement. Since there are external suppliers involved at the raw material supermarket, the Kanban flow will not be implemented over here in a traditional format. Rather, just like steel coil supermarket at Acme, a Kanban post will be installed at both the rods and forge socket supermarket where the withdrawal Kanban cards utilized by cut and machining processes will accumulate and be sent to production control at the end of the workday. Thereby, production control will be able to place its purchase order to both the suppliers based on actual consumption rather than MRP based quantities. As for the cut rods and machine forge socket supermarket, Well plus D flash will transfer withdrawal Kanban cards that mimic the pitch due to the pull in the value stream and both cut and machining processes will produce to that. As machining will supply diverse product variants to both weld 1 and weld 2 as you can uh, observe in the current state map, it is better that it produces as per a signal Kanban instead of the regular Kanban method. By deploying a signal Kanban, this would entail that the socket orders for similar variants will be clubbed together 
and machining will be asked to produce it in a large batch rather than as per the miniaturized pitch instructions. As for the cut rods, the production Kanban card can be equivalent to the withdrawal Kanban cards' denomination. That is, the Kanban loop of withdrawal and production will operate as default. The physical pull icons that you see here merely suggest that the inventory will be transferred manually, that is, without the use of automated equipment such as forklift or trolleys. This is merely because there is a presence of manpower in the form of supervisors which can manually move around the steering arms which is not a bulky nor a delicate product to handle as such. Overall, TWIs production lead time will improve by 77% by incorporating lean in TWIs current state value stream. That is, it will move from 48 days of production lead times in the current state to just 11 days of production lead time in the future state. The stagnating inventory will be regulated considerably. While the map just depicts the improvement in lead time, in, as in the, in the time terms, this would also result in significantly faster inventory turnover, prediction, predictable production targets, flexible production, reduction, reduction of waste, all of which would translate into lesser reliance on working capital, increase in operating cash flows and higher profitability. Subsequently, TWI should persist with continuous improvement, that is Kaizen to make its operations even better. With this, I have completed this elaborate value stream mapping video covering both the ACME and TWI cases. Hope you liked it. Would you like to try it out at your manufacturing organization? Get in touch. Contact details are mentioned in the next slide. By the way, the principles of lean and value stream mapping are very pragmatic and its value goes even beyond professional use. For all you know, you can map out your daily personal routine on a current state map and then try to spot the bottleneck, eliminate waste, incorporate pull-based flow, identify the pacemaker, level the activities and carve out a revised and a more productive daily routine for yourself. All the best.